Hello and welcome to the Tabletop Bellhop Gaming Podcast, episode 35, Breakout Con 2019 Wrap-Up. From Hamilton, Ontario, I'm Sean, and here with me, live from Windsor, Ontario, the Tabletop Bellhop himself, Mo T. I am the Tabletop Bellhop, your cardboard concierge, answering your game and game night questions and striving to make everyone's gaming experience better. Let me put my years of game playing, event organizing, and game night hosting to use for you. I'd like to say hi to everyone in the lobby here on Twitch. We start here live every Wednesday night at 9.30 p.m. Eastern at twitch.tv slash tabletopbellhop and continue on even after the double bell ends the show for more Off the Books After Show. Now today is going to be pretty much all about Breakout Con 2019, a great gaming convention the entire Belltop team attended two weeks ago. Due to all of us being at the con, we've invited Deanna to join us for the show today. Welcome to the show, Deanna, better known to many here as our moderator, and she games. Evening, folks. Now, after we're finished talking about Breakout, we do have, I do have one quick game review, and I do have a couple games to talk about in Tabletop Gaming Weekly. And I've finally got the Birds of Prey crossover deck for DC Deck Builder. We love interacting with our listeners and viewers. We're here for you. Each week, we're going to highlight some of those discussions, feedback we've received, comments on our content, gaming discussions we've been part of. We want to share what people have been saying, both positive and negative. We get better with your comments and suggestions, and if you'd like to let us know something about the show, send your feedback to mo at tabletopbellhop.com and or sean at tabletopbellhop.com. That's S-E-A-N. Uh, you can also hit us up on social media, where I can be found everywhere as Tabletop Bellhop, one word. We've got a kind com- meow. Yeah. Meow. We've got a comment <laughs> from Ryan Peach about our Kickstarter regrets episode. Raccoon Tycoon is the only thing I regret backing thus far. I backed to get the metal coins that replace the paper money, confident that they would make the game more accessible based on the other games I've backed with coins. In reality, they weren't only the largest denomination being of a different size than the rest. On that alone, I've left the game in the shrink. I knew the game had hidden card hands, but I just went in with it thinking that I'd find a way to make it work later. It was an almost last minute back. Clearly when animal characters are involved, my decision-making abilities should be called into question. Cute. Now, I thought this comment was rather interesting. Now, we've mentioned Ryan on the show before at least a couple times. Now, Ryan is vision impaired, and he's helped me in the past to consider accessibility when talking about and reviewing games. Now, in this case, Ryan was thinking that by getting a game with metal coins, he'd be able to tell the game currency apart. This got me thinking about games I own with metal coins. Now, in most cases, he's right. The coins from various denominations are different sizes. And when they're not, they're usually modeled different so you can tell them apart uh, easily by touch. But then I know there are other games where all the coins are the same sized. And details on them are small and, I'd have to assume, very hard to tell apart by touch. Now, Zaya really comes to mind for this because I didn't even notice the coins were different. Um castings until someone else pointed it out to me yet another thing that's good to see publishers taking into account and something that is becoming more noticeable when they don't yes very true now ryan and i continued the conversation on twitter but what i was wondering is if you our listeners and viewers have any suggestions for games with clearly differentiated money and tokens now the big one i thought of was viticulture with its very different sized and weighted coins that are also uh embossed so you can tell them apart by touch but i'm thinking there's got to be out there other games out there i can recommend to ryan i just can't think of any so i would love to hear your feedback let us know in the chat room go on to the web page click on ask the bellhop or fire us off an email we record the show live wednesday nights at 9 30 eastern on twitch and we encourage people to drop in and take part in our chat room in the lobby don't forget if you're here live we continue the show after the double bell in an off the books after show as well as some special features that might make it onto youtube Thanks to our moderator, and tonight, guest, Angie Games. Most episodes, we look to answer one or more of your game gaming or game night questions. You can send your questions to questions at tabletopbellhop.com, or head over to tabletopbellhop.com and click on Ask the Bellhop. Uh, Social media, of course, works too. We're everywhere as Tabletop Bellhop, one word. Well, the best way to get questions in is through the website. They're a little easier to track that way. I'm not going to say no to a question asked anywhere. 
This week, we are taking a break from the questions to spend some time geeking out about Breakout Con. Breakout Con is a fantastic, small but growing gaming convention held at the end of March break at the Sheridan Center in downtown Toronto. Now, last year, Deanna and I both attended Breakout 2018 and had an amazing time. Uh, this was our first small con since the old Windsor Game Fest that were held right here in Windsor. Uh, we had gone to Origins previous to that, but that's quite a different thing, quite a different beast, a lot bigger. Uh, I was there for all three days last year. Deanna was there for one day. That was Saturday. Now, at that event, I got to play Worldwide Wrestling with the designer, Nathan Paoletta. I played a near-finished copy of Hydro Hackers with Phil Vecchione. And I remember Deanna and I trying Sagrada and determining it was worth owning, even though we already owned Azul. I didn't do much on that Saturday. I remember I checked out the Bring and Buy auction, which must have taken me about an hour to go through thoroughly and try and find cool things to buy. And uh, I played in a game of... A really lengthy game of Rising Suns and just really perused the board game room for a long time and yeah that's about it. Now I think overall the biggest thing though at Breakout 2018 was meeting all the people. Like unlike big cons like Origins there's plenty of time and space to just hang out and chat with people at Breakout. Uh, it was here that I finally met the gem people. Those are the, the, the members that are part of the Gnome Stew encoded design misdirected mark group of Venn diagram mostly overlapping. A uh, bunch of people from Buffalo and beyond, uh, as well as uh, Chicago. I don't know. They're all over the place. But I finally got to meet these people in person. I also got to meet a ton of people that I knew only through social media, especially Google+. Now, these are people I interacted with almost daily online, and it was very cool to meet them in person. Now, the other thing that I couldn't help but notice and I found notable about BreakoutCon 2018 was that this was the most inclusive, welcoming, and safe con. Not only that, most inclusive, welcoming, and safe gaming space I've ever seen. Uh, due to this, it was also the my most diverse gaming area I've been to with people in all shapes, sizes, colors, and genders attending and playing games together. That was striking as so different from what you usually see. Yeah, that was pretty awesome, and it had a really great vibe. I had um, I had one bad experience in the board game room, and it was just a tiny thing. It was just some guys shot me down and said, oh, you might this game might be a little too tough for you to play. And I went and mentioned it to Mo, because to me, this is the kind of thing that just happens. As a woman, if I go out gaming, people are going to say goofy things like this. It didn't strike me as a big deal. He put it online, and the people that run Breakout saw it, and were all coming up and apologizing to me, and I was, I was so intensely embarrassed. But it was really sweet of them too. And then they informed me of the whole safety system that they had in play that I didn't even realize it was there. That there were safety ambassadors I could have went up to to talk to if I was uncomfortable, and you know, all kinds of cool things that I didn't even know was there. And it's just, it's a very super welcoming space. So, and 2019 was even better, even. Because they had put these uh, cards on the tables now explaining because I said, hey, there were safety ambassadors, but I didn't know about that because I didn't read the PDF only guidebook, right? Mm -hmm. So this year they had cards out on the tables that said, hey, this is what a safety ambassador looks like. If you need help, grab one of these cards, take it, go find a safety ambassador. So that was a really cool uh, upgrade, you know. Uh, yeah, I have to agree. Uh, that wasn't the only thing that was better this year. Overall, everything about Breakout 2019, everything we're about to talk about, talk about, to me was the same or better than 2018. It just, it, it's bigger, better, everything was awesome. Now, this was my first time attending Breakout Con, other than a uh, little unofficial stop <laughs> by the uh, camp uh, late one night uh, last year. And I have to say, everything, it was everything I expected and a bit more. Uh, it was certainly welcoming, inclusive, and despite being a small con, it was actually quite large. Uh, we spoke about it in the lead up to the event, but they had a lot of guests. And as I was uh, covering pan the panels primarily, I really got to see and hear a lot of great people talking passionately about their careers in gaming. So I think at this point, what we'll do is a day-to-day -day breakdown of the con, going all the way from Thursday to Sunday. Now, amidst Thursday, there was no con, but that's when Dan and I got up to Toronto. And we'll take a look at what each of us did each day. Um, again, that starts off with Thursday for Deanna and I. Now, we boarded the train here in Windsor at 9.05. Um, 
you know what? I think I'm going to let Deanna talk about via business class. She can probably sell it better than I could because she had to convince me that the train is awesome. And it took a little while to convince me, but I got to admit after breakout last year, I was sold. Uh, I love riding on the train. If we're going to have to drive to, from Windsor to Toronto, it's four hours. We're going to have to pay gas. We're going to have to pay to park the car. Stupid valet downtown Toronto prices once we get there. And I always splurge and take first class and they feed you and they give you booze and they bring you coffee and the food is good. And you get to, I like to sit and work on my laptop and write because I'm a writer and it's the best place to be ever. So I finally convinced Mo last year for the first time, I was like, breakouts right around my birthday. So I'm like, this will be my birthday portion of this thing is we are going to take the train and he begrudgingly did it. And then he's like, okay, yeah, now I see. (laughs) Yeah, and it's just a note, it's business class. Via business class is what they call their first class. Uh, And when we did the research, it wasn't that much more. Like, if you look at how much you're going to save on the other things, even the fact they they give you lunch, right? Like, they give you a full lunch. They give you uh, drinks if you want them. They bring snacks. If you go early enough, they give you this amazing bagel from somewhere up in Quebec. Like, just adding all those little extra bits. Like, if we were going to stop and eat lunch in Toronto when we got there, that's going to probably cost the difference between a regular train ticket and a business class ticket. Yeah, and I usually shop for good deals, too, but... It's definitely you are the worth, master of the good deals. <laughs> yeah, it's definitely worth checking the price difference between economy and via one. Sometimes it's as little as like five bucks. For five bucks, you can get, you know. Yeah. So the train trip up, um, the one interesting thing is they totally messed up the menu. So they announced like they have the driver or the dri- conductor. Is mm-hmm. that conductor? Yeah, the conductor. Is that the right term? Engineer? I think engineer. Whatever. Conductor. Conductor, the conductor announcing what's for lunch, and they're like, "You can have." Um, I all I remember was the first two things. I was like, "Yeah," and then the last thing was chicken salad, and I'm like, "Okay, that's not so bad." And then when they came, they were like, "I'd like chicken salad." They're like, "We don't have chicken salad. We have chicken schnitzel, or we have two other things that actually sounded good." And I'm like, "Wait a minute, what happened to like the mushroom ravioli?" They're like, "Oh no, we have three cheese ravioli." So I don't know what happened there. Uh, I end up getting the chicken schnitzel, which was good but odd because it was cold. So it was cold breaded chicken, which is a little different. But that's something else about via business classes. The food is good. Like I do, do the big dude likes food food blog thing, and I had to write up a post after last year's trip, just going, man, you got to try some of the food on this. Like it's it's not like it looks like airplane food. It looks like hotel hospital food on little trays. But man, like good food. What do you have on the way up? I can't even remember now. Fish, some kind of fish. And again, they screwed up because they said it was going to be halibut. And then they brought it around and they're like, would you like the grouper? And I'm like, sure. It was good. Yeah. Um, the other thing, oh my God, there was a little piece of prosciutto in the salad. That was amazing too. Uh, mm-hmm. The one disappointment is they have terrible beer on the way up, like really bad. It was like you could have Canadian Coors or Blue and that was it. Now, normally they have pretty good beer selection. Like It, it was bad enough. I didn't even have a beer on the way up. I'm like, no, nah, it's okay. Um... On the trip up, I did some reading. Uh, I finished off my RPG a month book for March. That's uh, Demon Lord's Companion, which, yeah, I got to get up a blog post for that. That's done. That's read. I uh, finished that a little early. Uh, we got into Toronto around 1.30 p.m. Uh, we were staying at the Fairmont Royal York, which is right across the street from Union Station, which was good because we had more than the usual luggage because Deanna had brought some of our kids' games uh, for Aaron's nephews, one of her friends. Yeah, so we we got a good rate on the hotel because the lobby was under construction. So it was loud, but it was only loud from like 9 a.m. on. But they weren't kidding because we were on the ninth floor and we checked in and we went up there and we could hear pounding and like our room was reverbing nine floors up. So yeah, but that's why we didn't stay on site. So normally I'd say it's worth splurging to stay on site, but I found a good deal. Yeah, so the, the con rate wasn't terrible, but we found significantly cheaper. Now, I mentioned already the con itself, Breakout Con, actually doesn't start till Friday. So we had time to kill. So we had originally hoped to meet up with Sean or Deanna's friend Aaron, but that fell through. It was fine. They both had things they had to do. Um, Deanna's the one that suggested we check out this place called the Rec Room. Now, this is a giant, uh, I I guess I'd say adult arcade. Arcade that welcomes adults, I think is probably a better way to put it. Uh, There's rumored to have really good food, really good beer. Plus, they have this really cool VR thing, and we were kind of hoping we'd go there and they'd have Ghostbusters. 
Um, Deanna can probably say more about the VR thing and how cool that is, because unfortunately they did not have Ghostbusters when we went there. Instead, we could have done our Wreck-It Ralph game, which was something I wasn't personally interested in. I did Ghostbusters with Aaron a year ago, and it was amazing. Like, it's VR, so you have on this proton pack and, you know, goggles and stuff, and you're walking around, and you look like Ghostbusters when you look at each other. The world's immersive. You reach forward, and you turn the dial on this TV, and you really feel a box there with the dial on it, and you can sit in this chair, and we got to sneak a peek at it, and it's just like, you know, there's a box there, a cardboard box, and a crummy chair and whatever, but it's it's very immersive and super neat, and uh, there's a spot where you're, like, standing outside on the side of a skyscraper, and it's windy, and the thing under you is moving, you're on, like, a painter's rail, on, and you reach out and you grab the rail, and it's cold, and I'm like, it's just, it's neat, it's very immersive. I wanted Mo to get to experience it, and they have a new one that is Star Wars, that is supposed to be utterly amazing. Aaron described it to me as a religious experience, and it's it's twice as long, and you get to be stormtroopers. But they only have it on certain days of the week, so when we went, we could have done Wreck-It Ralph, which, no, I don't need to do Wreck-It Ralph. Also, we hadn't taken into account the fact that it was March break, and the arcade was completely insane, oh packed with far too many children per square inch. Yeah, so we we did not stay. It it was a little crazy. Like the the whole place, all the tables were filled with adults who were eating and drinking, and there were just kids screaming everywhere. It, it was very, as Deanna would say, peopley. So we decided not to stay at the rec room. Um, just outside the rec room is this rather unique outdoor railway museum. So that was kind of cool. There's like all these different trains from other areas. I think it's owned by CN Rail. Um, all like you can actually like not interact with the trains but like you could technically climb on them and stuff so we kind of did that we walked around there took some pictures um there's a big the uh, steam whistle brewery is there which we didn't go to because i'm not a big fan of steam whistle i probably would have went if steam whistle made anything but steam whistle um from there we wandered downtown so to get to the rec room we took the skywalk which is this thing that comes off um out of union station that gets you to like the cn tower and all that stuff um being Canadians, we've all done the CN Tower thing many times. Not something we need to do while we're in Toronto. Uh, so we walked back to the hotel area, just overland, right? Like, just kind of wandered around downtown a bit. Uh, we were getting a little hungry, so we are kind of looking for lunch. Didn't really find anything. And then I had the idea, why don't we head to the Sheraton Center, where the con is, in case other people were coming into town? Because most people going to the con are probably going to stay there. So our plan was, let's go basically stalk people, hoping to see gamers coming in, right? Like, that that was pretty much it. Let's hope to see people we know. Because there are a lot of people going. It's not like we're just like, oh, that person looks like a gamer. No, we were looking for people we know. And we weren't we weren't doing this, the stalker thing we talked about in the previous you're going to jump on random gamers. Anyone with a cool t-shirt. Yeah, Fair. It's just like, oh, you're obviously a gamer. Hey, there's someone flying their geek flag. They must have listened to our episode. <laughs> Maybe that was it. Uh, welcome, Dragon Gem, into the chat. Uh, so we started walking. And on the way there, um, I got to admit, I, w I, was, I was frustrated we didn't get a bagel. So it ends up, if you go on the 5 a.m. train, you get this Montreal bagel. That, like, it's, it's, as re it's a religious experience, like the Star Wars thing, I guess. This is like the best bagel ever. I'm sure people in New York are probably going to be upset at me for this, but like, there's nothing better than a good Quebec bagel with this cream cheese that I don't know. I don't know how it's so good. Like it was a plain bagel. It didn't even have stuff on it. But anyway, we didn't get that because we took the nine o'clock train by taking the nine o'clock train. We just got lunch instead of breakfast. So I was kind of craving a bagel and right near the Sheraton Center is this place called Kiva's, K-I-V-A, Kiva's, uh, which is a bagel place. And the other important part was a sign that said since 1979. And I figure anywhere that's in Toronto that's been around since 1979 has to be pretty good so we went into kiva's i got an everything bagel with cream cheese which was good and then deanna got some kind of breakfast sandwich thing that looked amazing i think you had salmon on it or that was what you wanted no 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 yeah that's what i wanted to get but that was twice the price for 450 they cooked me an omelet right in front of me they were like Whoop, fresh things we'll chop them up do 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 omelet so it was like a western a western yeah, on a on a bagel it was really good and cheap yeah so, so really, I think we spent like 14 bucks total and we got coffees to go. So from there, we walked over to the Sheraton Center. We found some tables by the atrium. Um, we sat down and finally played a game. So first game of Breakout Con, the day before Breakout Con. So one of the things Deanna insisted I do is bring a quiver with me. So I had a quiver with me with Race for the Galaxy and five Keyforge decks, um, three of which I had never played. 
So we sat down, uh, Deanna grabbed her Keyforge deck, uh, I grabbed one of mine randomly, and I honestly at this point don't remember which one it was, and we played a game of Keyforge sitting there in the lobby area of the Sheraton. Uh, I remember I got completely destroyed because my deck was terrible as far as I'm concerned, because uh, it had a whole bunch of cards that were like, for every Mars card in play, get this, and I looked through and the entire deck had one Mars creature. So there's a disadvantage to Keyforge and the random deck generation. So don't give me a deck that says, give me X for Y when you only put one Y in the entire thing. Is it for every Martian card you have in play? Because I had a bunch of Martians up. I'm just wondering about the Oh, you know what? Maybe I need to reread the card. But again, if I wasn't playing against a Martian deck, that wouldn't mm -hmm. be very Yeah, no, I'm just there. wondering because my Martians are what kicked your butt, so... Yeah, no, your deck definitely kicked my butt. So there you go, first game of of uh, Breakout was Keyforge for Deanna and I. So for uh, the American listeners uh, who won't be familiar with uh, The Rec Room, it's a chain run by the movie theater uh, company that's overarching and, and runs is everywhere here in Canada. And it's uh, sort of similar to a Dave and Buster's is sort of the same mm -hmm. what I can think of when, you, when you're uh, comparing to American chains. Yeah, it looked like a cool place. Just don't go on March break unless you got little kids and you want them to have fun because it looked like all the kids were having fun. Like it was bad. We were standing in line to play a game, and people cut in front of us. Like it, it was that. That was the big thing. They're, they they had a kung fu panda drum game, and we literally stood there and watched someone finish. And then as we stepped forward, some other little kids snuck in and started playing. We're like okay, this dad with three little kids is like swipe the thing. Three kids are standing there, jumping up and down, mashing on this thing in a way it's not meant to be played. They died in about thirty seconds. It spit out a thing that said, "You win one token." And the dad just swiped the thing, and they did it again. And I was, I watched them do this three times, and I went, "Okay, that's enough. We're gonna go now." Yeah, that 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 was when we're like, "No, time to go." So right about when we finished up our game of Key Forge, we ran into our first uh, long-term friend, Victor Wyatt, who we first met at Queen City Conquest last year. Great guy, part of the the whole gem crowd. Not actually like he works for any of those, but he, he's a follower. I don't know, one of the hanger on. No, that sounds negative. I don't mean it that way. But but one of, one of the friends from, from that area. Uh, we had a great time. We went for dinner with Victor when we were at Queen City Conquest. Had a great dinner, just the three of us. So he, he was the first person we ran into. So that was cool. We sat down, started chatting with him, and then as we were chatting with him, more people started showing up. Uh, Danielle, Major Kayla, who's in our chat, showed up with her husband, Owen. Um, Jen Adcock and... I was with them as well. They had just come in from Buffalo. And then the group just kept expanding, right? We just put more chairs down. Uh, eventually, we had some other Buffalo people, Andrew Murray, Jerry Myers. Uh, they, we just, the group kept growing until someone eventually complained they were hungry. Uh, so we went to Quinn's for dinner. Now, Quinn's is attached to the hotel, and usually that's a bad sign. Now, I had gone last year and had some great pub food. Now, what I didn't realize is that when I went last year, it was on St. Patrick's Day, and it was a special menu. So while the place looks like an Irish pub, it's actually more of a steak and seafood place, and it has the prices to match a steak and seafood place. So while that meal was quite good, it was quite a bit more to spend and cost quite a bit more than we planned on spending. Though no one else seemed to complain, but I felt kind of bad going, hey, let's go to this pub, and it wasn't really a pub, and man, the prices started at like 30 bucks a plate. Serious lack of shepherd's pie, yeah. Yes, yeah, I wanted bangers and mash, actually, is what I was complaining, what I was craving. Uh, from Quinn's, we started to get texts about, hey, where is everyone, where are you at? Um, so we headed to base camp. Now, base camp is worth mentioning. There is an area of breakout con. Uh, at this point, the con's not even set up. So we went to the third floor where the con is. I think that's the third floor. It's one floor up when you get in, but then there's floors down. Second floor? Uh, on the elevator. Technically, technically, it's the second floor on the elevator. All right, second floor on the elevator. So we head upstairs to the second floor, up the escalators. We go down the hall, and if you just follow the hall to the right, it kind of comes around. They have this area of seats, right? There's some couches and some cushions and some chairs. And last year, the whole gem group, everyone who knew each other, kind of took over that spot. And they ended up calling it base camp. So anytime you finished a game, you would head over to base camp and see who was there and generally hang out there between games. So we headed there the night before. So the con's not even set up, and we went to base camp. Because I had a feeling other people would check there, and sure enough, that's exactly what happened. We set up at base camp, and people checking into the hotel were like, huh, I wonder if there's anyone at base camp. And that area just grew. 
Um, I think by probably by the end of the night, there were 30, 40 people at base camp. Uh, one of the memorable ones is Ryan Macklin showed up uh, with an alcoholic beverage in hand with this bag of stuff that he thumped down on the table that was all of his stuff for playing the game Myth Ender, which is a role-playing game he wrote about killing a god. Um there were some other adult beverages being pe- passed around. Uh, many of the con organizers stopped by that night. So we got to see Rob and his wife, Rachel, Kate, Adam, Ali, uh, more gem people as they came in and basically ended up with a huge bunch of us hanging out. Uh, some people having some drinks, most of us not just chatting and meeting up. And like, it was one of the better nights and the con hadn't even started yet, which I thought was very cool. It was everything I wanted from breakout con, all the meeting, the people all there that first night. And we were there till after, 2 a.m. Yeah, good people. I ended up being volunteered to uh, go help fill out a bunch of paperwork for the uh, like the game assignments for the next day. But even that was fun because I was with you know I was with the same group of people and we're chatting and stuff. So it was it was a good night. It was a really good start to the con. So I am hearing from the chat that we are echoing a bit still. Hmm. The other thing is I'm going to stop just for a minute because Deanna keeps freezing up and I'm missing half of what she's saying and then it speeds up and gives me all of what she's saying at once. So I'm going to go try to turn off a couple things that might still be on my Wi-Fi, hoping that'll free up some bandwidth. So we'll get one minute. Standing by. My phone is in airplane mode. Yeah, this doing the three-way with all of us talking and two of us um, broadcasting from one location. This is the first time we've tried this. So. Yeah, two people on the same... I wondered why there was such a pause. Every time I stop talking, you look at me for a bit and I'm like, I'm done now, Mo. <laughs> <laughs> two people broadcasting in the same house on the same internet connection seems to be uh, questionable. Yeah, maybe next time if we do this, we'll try and uh, skedaddle up next to each other in front of the computer. Yeah, it's, it's got to be the Wi-Fi. I'll see if that helps. Mo just came down here and shut off a bunch of stuff. Yes, we were voluntold. And I also enjoyed that because I am also a weird librarian type. It's like sorting and figuring out things. Ooh. So Adobe's not running in the background still on your laptop or anything? Uh, I will double check, but I basically kicked Adobe off my system. <laughs> Sean, are I you saying the same thing? Didn't as didn't want like... to wait for yeah. it to finish yeah. downloading, so I've got nothing running right now. Nothing. Huh. I've got the Twitch chat. Yeah, she basically shut sort the Twitch of pauses chat, but I'd rather and not it do stops that. up for a while and then... Yeah, and it just happens. Dumps. Yeah. All right, so it's not just me. I don't know what else I can do to... Let me try one more thing here. Stuff to edit out of the podcast. I have running is podcast notes, Twitch chat, and Skype, and Audacity. No, the only things. Oh, no, here's a few more. Fresh reboot. I can take the Philips Hue off. That really shouldn't be using a lot of data. (laughs) No. I'm just looking at what's on here. I've got my PC. I've got Focus, which is your laptop. I got the printer, which really shouldn't be doing anything. But I can power down the printer just in case. Come on. All right, printer's going to shut down. I have the Philips Hue. It's most Hue. likely just my laptop lagging because I don't, I don't know. But we that's don't get guess. this problem when we're doing Gloomhaven streams, so I don't know. Oh, that's true. That's true, and you have an equal amount of things. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Running. I don't know if there's one weird thing on our Wi-Fi that I don't know what the hell it is. Booted. NM9CAHBU. I don't know what that is. Just boot it. Uh, then I gotta get its MAC address. Give me one second to do that, just in case. See if it helps. Real live network security. Yes. <laughs> on... I'm pretty sure it's something legit. I just don't know what it is. Might be your phone. Is your phone in airplane mode? My phone's in airplane mode. I double checked because it's sitting right next to me. I double checked as soon as you said there was problems. So that's not it. D zero. 
So we've got two dragon gems in the chat. Sorry. Two dragon gems. Well, one used to be a dragon gem. One is a dragon gem now. Ah. All right. I just have to go tell this to block this Mac address. Wireless Mac filter. Add. Apply. Hopefully this doesn't, this shouldn't kill <laughs> rebooting our the, Rebooting the, road, the router would be real bad right now. No, it shouldn't. <laughs> it really shouldn't. Okay, Sean froze right when you said that, and I was like, "No, no, like there'll now. be a little, <laughs> little drop there." I just blocked that, so we'll see if that helps. I don't know what the hell I just blocked, but we blocked something on my Wi-Fi, and D's frozen right now, so that didn't help. No, I'm still I don't here. Know. I still see yeah. you. I it hear is you. what it is. I mean, yeah. as long as we've got a nasty. The audio is going to be good. <laughs> we'll uh, we'll right. make it work. Continue on. I was then. hoping it was just me. Oh well. So we're at Friday. All right, we're on Friday. Uh, I need one other thing open here. There we go. Boom. Are we dinging before Friday? Do you want me to ding for any quick here? I wasn't going to ding before days, but we could ding. Sorry. Friday morning. Uh, Deanna and I split up. She headed over to Comic-Con because that is going on the same weekend as Breakout. I headed to Breakout. Um... For my part of it, I headed back to Kiva's because Kiva's was really good. The sandwich D got looked really good. I don't like Westerns, but the whole eggs on bagel thing looked good. Uh, I got a beef salami and egg bagel, and I got to say, it, it was good. It needed cheese. If when I, I My plan was when I go back Saturday, I would get it with cheese, but that didn't turn out so good. Uh, well, there I met up with Sean because uh, he had come down. And uh, I... I went in and I figured I would just grab a coffee and I tried to get just a plain old brewed coffee and they're like, no, no, no. If you're going to be here, you should have an Americano. Let us make you an Americano. And they convinced <laughs> themselves to make me an Americano rather than just tapping right. the uh, the pot of coffee that was right there. So, and it was good. Yeah, the coffee was fine. There was nothing wrong with the coffee. It was well-priced and, and the bagel was excellent. Uh, from there, Sean and I both walked over to the convention center, walked over to the Sheraton Center. At this point, it was around 9.45, 9.50. The con opens at 10. Uh, heading up the escalator, we did see a line, which in my opinion was a good thing. Like, I did want to see some line up, but it wasn't too long. Like, it was, there was no hour wait to get your badge or anything Origins or Gen Con-like, but it wasn't empty either so I, I was pretty happy with what we saw um the two of us went up and got our passes uh i will note this is probably important for disclosure's sake all three of us were there as media so they did provide our badges i probably should have said that right at the top of the podcast but uh i didn't think of to mention it until now but yeah we were all there as media so we went to the the, the special guest table got our tabletop bellhop badges which for some reason didn't have our names on them but whatever um Got lanyards, all that fun stuff. And then Sean and I started checking things out. Uh, at this point, it was pretty much just sharing pictures of things on social media. The one thing I couldn't help but notice right away was how much bigger the con was. Now, it's still in the same spot. But the thing is, last year, they only had about a third, maybe a half of the floor this year, they had all of the second floor of the Sheraton Center. Literally every room was dedicated to Breakout Con. Um, besides, like there was a huge ballroom for board games. And I wish I'd noted it here in the notes, because Sean and I did the math to figure out how many tables it was. But it was like over 800, if not more. There was a lot. Like say, I'm going to say about 1,000 people could play in that room. Now, we found an overflow room that held another 400 plus people. Now, that was, again, just supposedly for board games. Now, there was another separate room, a separate ballroom, just for D&D Adventures League. There was another ballroom just for war gamers. There was a family room. Now, this wasn't a ballroom, but there was a significant amount of space just for families filled with family games. And when I say filled with family games, these were gamers' family games. Like, there was not a copy of Candyland in there. There was no Monopoly. Instead, you had, like, real, actual good kids' games. Karuba, uh, Drop It, I remember seeing in there. Um, Rhino Hero, Viva Topo, all games we've recommended over the years and some great family games. There was a room dedicated just to LARPs. Uh, there was a room on Friday that was literally dedicated to 18xx games and learning to play 18xx games. Actually, that's where uh, Major Kayla's husband was pretty much all of Friday, was in there playing 18xx games. Now, the rest of the weekend, they turned that, uh, the 18xx people took over the room and it was the heavy gamer room. Uh, there, there were more. I, I can't even remember all the little dedicated rooms. But overall, more rooms, more space, and more games to be played. 
There were, there were so many rooms, they actually put all the painters out in the lobby. They set up tables yep. in the lobby for the painting area. Uh, and importantly, uh, talking about inclusion and uh, and things, they had a quiet room. Yeah. So they had a dedicated room that was just for, you know, when things got to be too much for people. Because, God, I know, cons and large groups of people can be horrifying. So they had a place where you could go and just, you know, chill out and... and get away from the, the crowds and, and recenter yourself to uh, be able to jump back in and join more games. You know, the thing with the painting being out in the lobby area, you get a lot of natural light coming in there through those windows. It's actually really great lighting. It's way better than the ballrooms. Well, unfortunately, that weekend wasn't the best lighting in general just because of weather. But but in theory, absolutely. <laughs> uh, so we did a bunch of wandering around. There, there was no gaming to be had here. Like I said, we were there as media. This was us doing the media thing. Uh, I spent a lot of time on Twitter that day. Uh, eventually, Sean and I split up. I I think he was heading to panels. I ended up hitting the path for lunch. Uh, now, for anyone who is not in Toronto, that is the shopping dungeon that exists underneath Toronto, where you can have random encounters with business people rushing about and other shoppers and tourists taking pictures. Uh, it's something to be seen. If you haven't seen the path, there is literally a dungeon underneath most of downtown Toronto uh where you can easily get lost it's it's something else something to be seen just shopping district after shopping district did we lose deanna nope nope i think she's just typing why did or it drop me lost her. i just got deanna has left oh i have no idea why it dropped me sorry guys oh, oh. she's back there we go i don't know if i need to repeat that bit about the path or if we oh, just I go think, with it i think we're good Dean knows these knows what the path is all right, okay. that was more thing for the <laughs> podcast. So anyway, I hit the path. We, I, I went adventuring in the dungeon and managed to run into Phil and Senda from Panda's Talking Games podcast. Uh, Victor Wyatt was with them and a few other gamers. Um, they were in one of the better food courts I remember finding over the weekend, and I hit up a place called Biryani and had some fantastic butter chicken, actually, very reasonably priced. Um, I've raved about the one here locally at Devonshire Mall. This place beat the one at Devonshire Mall. Uh, that was good. So sat there, chatted with Phil Senda. I think Ryan Macklin was there. There was a big group of gamers. We took over this large table. Uh, it was amusing because a bunch of gamers taking over a table meant everyone around us slowly left because we were obviously disturbing their very business-like business lunch where we get things done. Uh, they didn't seem to like us just chatting. Um, after getting back from lunch, I did some more social media. Uh, that's when I checked out some of the vendors. Uh, there was more vendors this year, which is good to see. Everything was more more of, more of than last year. Um, there were vendors, again, were mostly out in the hallways, which is still a little odd to me. They don't, there's no vendor room at Breakout Con. Instead, the vendors are set up on the concourse. Uh, there was a good mix of stuff. One of the things I was frustrated by last year is when I make a new RPG character, I like to have a new set of dice for that new character. Last year, I didn't bring dice. Because I planned on buying dice at the con to have for my new characters. This year I knew better because last year there was no dice to be had. Well, this year that was not the case. There were at least three different vendors selling dice. Some only selling dice. And some really nice dice, to be honest. Uh, there was a place called Board and Sword that had a ridiculous selection of RPG stuff. The guy behind the counter at one point guaranteed me they have every RPG ever published if I want something for it. He said, we may not have every book, but we have something from every RPG published. The thing was, they didn't have it all there. Now, they had a large selection there, and it was all in comic boxes, but they also have a store somewhere in Toronto. Because I did test them on that on Sunday, and they failed. They didn't have what I wanted there, but they had it at the store. Uh, there were board games. Uh, there was the a big table set up by the Toronto Area Gamers, being G-A-Y-M-E-R-S, where they were selling t-shirts, pins. Um, other, they had these big chalice things that look kind of cool. Um, there was a someone th doing 3D printing scenery who was there not only to sell the scenery, but to sell the patterns. Um, there were people demoing games. There was quite a few companies there doing demos of games, including some big names. I totally forget the name of the company that's working with Blue Orange Games to put out Planet, but there was a, a bunch of companies doing different things. Um, Geeky Goodies was there. Chris, uh, we've mentioned him on the show before. Chris's stuff, selling t-shirts. Uh, basically lots of vendors, so I checked out those. I was a little frustrated, uh, especially when you got into the Proto TO area on the way to Board Gaming Lounge. The the blur between I've got a new game I'm demoing and I'm an actual merchant 
blurred a little bit. Yeah. And and it would have been nice to see a little more sort of separation between look at my look at my game and why don't you want to learn about it or I'm actually a merchant selling something and it was it, it got a little sort of gray in there. Yeah, I can agree with that. The, the, that one hallway. I honestly yeah. heck there there was um the one place was that it's an inn. It was a brew pub that has a fantasy theme that was there. And I had no idea until the last day of the con that it was them trying to get people to go to eat dinner at their place. And I just thought they were someone selling RPGs because the name yeah, was like, like Dark Raven or something like that. And they had a giant yeah. D20. But the D20 was how much percent off you got off your meal if you went to eat there that night or something. I mean, I kind of wish I had heard about that a previous day. But like they were just mixed in with everything else, right? And you couldn't tell. I agree. Storm, Storm Crow Manor, uh, Manor yeah. thanks. Uh, McGanth, McGanth from the uh, chat room there. Hey, welcome, McGanth. That's not a name I recognize. Always cool to see new people. But overall, yeah, I, I'll admit I didn't buy anything. I didn't actually do any demos. I just kind of went around to see what there was. There, there was an interesting mix of stuff. I'll put it that way. Um, somewhere in there, I, I couldn't even tell you what time it was, Sean and I met up and we played the second game of the con, which again was Keyforge. Uh, at this point, I think he was sick of seeing panels, which actually, if you want to talk about some of the panels you hit before then, cause that's where you yeah. were all morning. So my, my morning, well, I guess technically afternoon, they didn't actually start any panels until noon. So after we walked around and did our social media duties first thing in the morning, uh, I, when lunch, when you went around for lunch, I went up and hit the first panel. Uh, and that first panel was getting your game to market. Uh, now this was, uh, with, uh, Doreen Dotto. And Daryl Andrews. Now, Doreen, I wasn't familiar with at all, but Daryl uh, is the uh, one of the publishers of a game we've talked about many times here, Sagrada. Nice. So we're familiar with some of his work. Um, Doreen Dotto uh, has a um, educational children's game, uh, Clue, Kuk Kuklu, K U K K L O O is uh, is her sort of main game. But it's very much an educational sort of school-based game. Uh, and it was interesting because they had uh, some really strong opinions about uh, how to get that game to market. Uh, and it was much uh, less of a self-publication as more of a self-directed um, way to get into the, the real market. Uh, they talked a lot about uh, the Chicago toy convention and, and things and sort of ways to get that game in front of people who will put your game onto the market, getting the publishers and other people out there. Uh, and, you know, they, they didn't really do much with the way of Kickstarter and were a little on the dismissive side of, of Kickstarter, which was interesting. Uh, but, for, uh, but for the people who really do want to not sort of handle it themselves and would like to give it off to a publisher, uh, it was an interesting talk. Uh, and then after that, uh, I moved on to the beginnings and basics of board game design. Uh, this one came up right afterwards, and it was an interesting one. Uh, it was uh, The panelists were Alicia Tolk, Nikki Valens, and Shannon McDowell. Uh, and they were uh, a lot, very, very strongly focused on a lot of that playtesting. Mm -hmm. uh, this is the one where I was tweeting out, and it's like, yo, this person just immediately, you know, said exactly what we said when we were complaining about manuals, or this person said exactly what they said we we said from this episode. So they were right on board with, you know, making sure you you do the legwork up front. And one of their big topics, and uh, uh, they were they were pimping in somebody's book that's on Kickstarter right now, is fail faster. Yeah. Um, they want you to, you know, the moment you've got that idea scribble it onto a blank card or on three by five cards. Don't worry about what it looks like or, or building something professional, get the concept, the mechanics down on that table as fast as you can. And if it's horrible, if it's a disaster, you know, right away. Yeah. And you're not going to spend three months of your life building miniatures for something that isn't really a game. Uh, so fail faster was a, was a really great theme that came out of that, uh, that design uh, meeting. There was a, they had a lot of great topics, but I think the real big takeaway was get it onto that table as soon as you've got that idea, and find out right away if it's something you should go with, go ahead with, or move on from. Uh, yeah, that that topic came up a couple times. I remember. Yeah, there were a few other topics where it, where it just kept coming back because it really is that important. You know, you don't want to waste your life on, especially in a crowded board game market or or RPG market with something that's just going to fail uh, later. 
Uh, and I believe that time that was so that was around two two thirty when I came down and we ended up uh, connecting up for our our my first game of the con, which yeah. was <laughs> which was uh, Keyforge. Key yeah. So yeah, so so this was Sean's first time actually playing with his Keyforge cards. So yeah. <laughs> he finally got to try them and showed off his. I gotta admit they're nice. Uh, the tokens you got. We're gonna have to try yeah. to remember to put a link to those in the show notes. So so here I showed up and I, I finally found a Keyforge starter set. Right, like they were really hard to find for a while there, and I got my cardboard tokens and cards and in the meantime sean's like i give up i'm not gonna bother buying a starter set found a really nice set on etsy and i gotta say they're really nice and they're from the same person who did my terraforming mars inserts which i really like really impressed by those we played two rounds if i remember correctly we split i think i won one you won yeah one. yeah I, I hated my first deck and loved my yeah. second and you hate it and you loved your first and hated yeah. your second deck. yeah exactly um it was it's very much i i now i see why people buy a lot of decks because mm. There's a real hit and miss uh, aspect to those decks. Uh, the first one did not connect with me at all, and maybe I could play it again differently, but maybe not. Uh, I feel like I, I got through most of that deck and didn't really see the uh, the benefit of it. So yeah, no, I found the same thing. I I want to buy more decks actually because I forget which faction it was. There was some faction. Every deck, all five I bought had this one faction in it. Shadow, and I'm like, man, I'm getting sick of shadow cards. I want, I'm like, I might even go to CG Realm where they have some open packs just to buy the sets with the characters or the the factions I haven't tried yet. So yeah, we we did a, a swap, one of each. Um, it was fun. I'm I'm digging Key Forge. the The most frustrating thing though, and I think this is true from the game Deanna and I played, is man, I just want a paper rule book. I am so frustrated by having to go we, online and yeah. look up the rules because man, we, we had to look up phone. a lot of stuff. Yeah. We both had our phones on the table with the PDFs loaded up and, you know, every three or four turns we were like, well, okay, I know about this, but what if I do this? Okay, hold on. Let me, yeah. you know, search the PDF. Uh, and that was, that was frustrating. Yeah, it's annoying. And like if I had a paper rule book, I realized it wouldn't have the greatest errata, but the stuff we were looking up weren't edge cases. No. It was like, wait, this has an ability that it, none of my previous cards have had. And I can't, there was one ability I'd never heard of before. Yeah, I forget. Yeah. I don't remember what it was now. So yeah, we played two games of Keyforge. So at this point, my con's been three games of Keyforge. But hey, why not? <laughs> <laughs> With all these games around me. But again, we were there. We were there to do media. But I was feeling I had to try something new. I, I felt guilty not having played something new and not even having anything to report on. Right. So we split up again. Uh, Sean went off to a to another panel, and I got to play this game, Planet. This is the game I tried to sell everyone all weekend because, man, is it good. Like, it's it's Azul good, I think. I, I haven't played enough times to know if it has a lasting ability. But you basically get a giant plastic D12, and each round you were going to draft terrain tiles. And the, the D12 is your planet, right? It's nice and blue. And you're going to put terrain tiles on them. Now, the terrain tiles have six different regions on each tile, and they're made up of, I'm gonna, I may be wrong on the number, five or six different terrain types. So you've got like forests, water, deserts, um, I don't know, whatever, tundra. I don't remember. All different colors. And then each of the six could be like one tile may have one water and three forest and two tundra right so it's all different ratios of those different terrain types and you put it on your nice die and it sticks there because it's magnetic and then the first two turns you're just adding them and then you start drafting animals and the animals are there and they're going to go to the planet with the most appropriate terrain or a biome or whatever right so you're going to look and you go well the tigers are going to move to the player's planet who has the most deserts that are not touching tundra and then you all look at your planet and go, okay, who has the most deserts not touching tundra? Okay, you get to keep the tigers. And then you're going to go to the next animal. And it's whatever, zebras want to go to forests that are touching uh, water. So you're going to count and say who has the most. And then the other type are most of a certain terrain type, but it's most regions not touching each other. So another animal type might go to whoever has the most individual separate deserts. So not biggest desert. So you've got three different things you're looking at. And there are... I'm going to say 12 to 15 different animals out and each round at the beginning, your two animals are going to go and the next round it's two animals are going to go to plants and it's three animals, three animals, three animals until you get to the end. And 
wow, like it seems so simple, but the planning ahead going, well, I'm not going to get this now, but by next turn I can get that. And looking ahead to see what animals are available and knowing that the guy across from me just won biggest desert with six, knowing that, man, I just need seven, then I'm going to steal these cards. Really way more thinking than it looks for a game that can literally be taught in about three minutes. The other thing was the fact that I lost my train of thought. Where did it go? This obviously is in my show notes. I'm improving here. I completely forget what the other thing was. Lots of thought. Da, da, da. Oh, scoring. That's what it was. End of game scoring. So you can probably cut that middle section out of the podcast. End of game scoring is ridiculously simple. So all it is, is you get a card that tells you one of the train types. And everyone's going to get a different train type. And you're either trying to make like a water world, a desert world, a forest world. Right? Very, very Star Trek of them. Or Star Wars, I guess. Both, really. Um, and you are going to get points for how many total squares you have of that type. The thing is, you're then going to score your animals, but the animals of the appropriate type, so your desert animals are only worth one point, but all the others are worth two. So while you're trying to collect all of one terrain type, you don't want to just collect animals for that terrain type, if that makes sense. Like, it's kind of unique that way. So your best terrain type is actually what's going to score you the least, which I thought was a really unique twist. So while... uh the uh, demo of Planet was going on, I'd gone back up to panels, and the first thing I saw was, what can art do for your game? And this was an interesting one. Uh, it was Shell Khan and Emily Griggs, who are both professional artists, uh, and you know what? They really had a great viewpoint, because they, they actually both did game design as well, but their, their careers, essentially, were, were professional artists. And I think that's a lot, something that a lot of people don't necessarily think about. And so while I think the, the title was a little misleading, I think, you know, the game, good art is going to sell your game. Not a big shock. Um, but a lot of what I took away from that panel was how to talk to artists, to real artists, how to submit, you know, documents to artists, how to work with one artist or a group of artists and how that should be different. Um, and also what are the benefits of using multiple artists versus one artist for your entire project? Um, or if, you know, if you've got a bunch of artists, cause that's what you're kind of stuck with. How do you, how do you manage that? Um, and it was a really interesting take, um, uh, by people who are again, pr primarily artists and afterwards, um, secondary, um, you know, working with games and game designers and hearing about their process and how they enjoy when, it, when, uh, production teams and designers work with them and problems they've had with designers and sort of, you know, looking for those, little moments with, where you can make a difference and really improve the flow, uh, made for a great plan, a great panel. And that sounds way better than the other panel we went through that day. Cause I joined you on the panel on play testing and development. Um, I was done my game. So I went upstairs, met up with Sean and sat down to listen to my first panel at the con. And now I'm, it wasn't terrible, but I got to admit it, it was okay. There, there was one of the presenters who was, uh, overpowering, uh, strong personality that kind of answered all the questions. And I got to admit, except for the thing that Sean had already got, which was fail faster. That was the only thing I'll admit I got out of that. Um, I thought it was going to be a panel on how to play test and how to develop. Instead, it was a panel on I've developed my game. How do I find play testers and how do I get my game developed? So it was not at all what I sat down because I do play test games and I have helped people with development. I am not writing my own game looking for this. I want to help other people. So it was the opposite of what I was yeah. looking for. Uh, but the one good thing was that whole fail faster that came up multiple times during that con. And it's the same point Sean made. It was get your game to the table quickly and learn that it's broken before you put more work into it. Um, there was one new designer. I, I, you may have the names. I didn't take notes on the names, but there was one new designer with only one game under his belt who talked about spending six months making the game look good before playing it only to learn the game was broken in the first turn. Yeah. I believe that was Andy Kim. Um, yeah, and uh, yeah, it was Andy Kim, Erica Hayes uh, Buriuris, and Pam Walls were the uh, the panelists there. Uh, and yeah, I, I was a little disappointed. Um, it was also very Toronto centric. Uh, yes, Toronto, Toronto, God bless them, has a fantastic uh, system with Prototio and with the various game cafes, and now with uh, Spiel North, Proto Spiel North. 
all available to game testers in the Toronto area for playtesting. But it would have been really nice to let people know, you know, if you're from small town, where do you go? And and even though we tried to sort of eke that out of them, it never really came out. Um, yeah, basically, so I, I asked the question, how do you find playtesters and developers? And they like, just go to your li- lo- your closest unpub. And I'm like, well, yeah. my closest unpub's four and a half hours away. And they're like, oh, sorry. Like, <laughs> thanks. Yeah, no, it was, it was, uh, they, they definitely come from a place of privilege being in Toronto and, and having these resources available. And unfortunately, I don't really think they grasped that, uh, because they were in Toronto doing their talk. Um, mm-hmm. so that was, that was unfortunate. Um, overall, not a terrible panel. It just wasn't what I no, wanted, right? No, like, exactly. If I had just, if I'd realized like the, the, the panel description, maybe there's something, there's a, there's a take home for anyone listening from breakout con, maybe a bit more info on what the panels are about. Kind of like the RPGs. Like if they, the RPGs have a full description of what the game's going to be about, maybe something on the panel so that people like me don't go in expecting it to be a panel on how to play test and develop. Instead, it was about getting play testers and developers. Yeah. It was actually interesting because the, um, it, the, I found the, I think, the titles more so than the descriptions were uh, somewhat misleading. And I don't want to say misleading because the, they were on topic, but they, I guess the way you could, you could read them in two different directions. Yeah. And that's what happened for this one. But interestingly, my other panel of the day um, was designing Asian themes in board and role-playing games. And I have to say, this was actually one of the most enjoyable panels I went to, but also the most misleading. <laughs> um, and, and I think they all knew it going in. Uh, it was, uh, Banana Chan and Agatha Chan and, um, Agatha's, uh, partner in, uh, podcast. Daniel Kwan. Daniel Kwan and, uh, Mendez, uh, Mendo- uh Mendoza, uh, jumped oh. in. Um, that he's not yeah, on the list. The he's not on the list, but he jumped in because, uh, somebody else wasn't able to make it. And then, uh, Sharang, uh, Biswas was also there. And, it, it turned into this fantastic and fabulous discussion on not only um, Asian tropes and stereotypes and, and some of the horrible things that come from it, but just general inclusiveness and um, racial equality and thinking about any time you're putting anything, any other race or any, anyone else in your game, you know, think really hard about who this is affecting. Mm-hmm. Um and I came away with uh, some, th- some really great thoughts. Like, I mean, first off is if you think there's a problem, get somebody out there. You know, get yourself a consultant. If, you, if you're if you even considering the fact that there's a problem, there is. So mm-hmm. bring someone in. Uh, but also there's some, some interesting thoughts about um, the differences in populations. Because, you know, people, uh, one, of the, one of the examples I took away with was, you know, a lot of people were upset about the... Um, uh, and, uh, not Angelina Jolie, uh, Scarlett Johansson in, uh, Ghost in, the anime, Shell. in Ghost in the Shell. And what was interesting was the, the Japanese diaspora. So the, the, the Japanese who have left Japan and settled across the world were very upset by this. The people in Japan weren't necessarily upset by this. They thought it was great. But just because they thought it was great doesn't mean it's not a problem. You know, you have to look at the people who are affected by it. And, and maybe part of the Japanese population isn't, but the fact that there is a Japanese population, uh, yes, James Mendez, um, uh, the, the fact that there is a population that was affected means it's a problem. Um, and, and, and being able to look at the different, uh, you know, the Chinese diaspora and the Japanese diaspora and, and these populations that have become multiple populations uh, was something I hadn't ever grasped and I never thought about. Uh, and even though I didn't learn anything about how to put an Asian theme into a game, <laughs> right. I learned a whole lot about why I shouldn't, uh, unless I've got someone who's able to represent it authentically. Yeah. That, that was another recurring theme in many of the pod, uh, panels, even the little bits I saw was hire a diversity consultant, hire a, uh, what's the other term? Um, I want to say safety consultant, but that's not the term. But someone making sure your game's safe. Uh, that that was definitely recurring. And pay them. Don't just 
go to your Asian friend and say, hey, is this game safe, right? Like, yeah. get get an actual consultant. It, it was definitely a recurring theme. Again, ties in well with uh, the whole theme of Breakout and diversity, safe space, and everything else that, that Breakout's all about. And again, good to see, right? Um, yeah. That was probably something else worth noting about the panels. You went to m way more than I did, but these were not a bunch of 40-year-old white men sitting talking to us. No, absolutely not. Uh, and and uh, one thing that was called out really early on uh, in Twitter was... Um, there were a bunch of panels that were all female, but they just were. It wasn't women talking about board games. It was yeah, that was awesome. A talk about board games and the fact that there were a bunch of women up, up there was fantastic. But they weren't calling these panels in any gender or or, or racial manner. Uh, you know, other than this this one talk about designing Asian themes. Um, it was you know it was just a topic about you know a topic about games and. There are men up there. There are women up there. There are people of color. There are all sorts of, you know, gender um, diversity. And that wasn't part of the title. That wasn't part of the, yes. the talk. It just it, yeah, happened as far to as be part tell, of the talk. I'm sure it was somewhat intentional, but it wasn't like they put together a diverse panel. Just the panels were diverse, which is fantastic. Uh, Nancy Games, Deanna, did note sensitivity consultant. That is the, the word I was looking for. Uh, so you did some panels. Uh, at this point, I broke off and played my official first official signed up event, and that was a role playing game because that is something I like to do at cons. I've learned is play role playing games. Uh, not something I tend to do at home much anymore. Uh, this game was Sentinel Comics. It was run by the fantastic Eric Paquette, again someone who I met at Breakout twenty eighteen, who I really enjoyed hanging out with. Uh, Eric ran a fantastic game. He a big part of that was how excited he was for this role-playing game system. Now, I don't know if Eric's just excited about every game he runs, but man, was he into Sentinel Comics. Like, dude was excited about this game. Uh, I first saw Sentinel Comics at Origins last year. Now, this is a role-playing game based on the Sentinels of the Multiverse card game, board game, uh, which has spread out to some comics and some other stuff. So this is a role-playing system. Um, I know one of the lead developers on it was Cam Banks, and Cam is the man responsible for Marvel Heroic role-playing put out by Margaret Weiss, which was, in my opinion, the best superhero game I had ever played. This was a great system that, unfortunately, Marvel shut down because they were about to do this whole cinematic universe thing, and they thought it was going to be a big deal. Well, it ends up they were right. But sadly, they pulled back the Marvel role-playing license because, I don't know, they've held on to it. They haven't done anything else with it yet, but it'd be great to see them do something. So unfortunately, this great game was dead. And thankfully, Cam moved on to write this Sentinel comic system, which you can see the roots of Marvel Heroic. Um, it's still, you're going to build a dice pool. It's still very narrative, but man, it's better. Like, I used to think that Marvel Heroic was the best superhero game out there. I'm starting to think Sentinel Comics may be better. Uh, really distilled down the dice pool system to something simpler that only uses three dice. Uh, does some funky stuff that I have no idea on the probability of where you're going to roll three dice. And you take the middle number between the three dice. I've never seen that before. So very unique. I'd hate to, like I said, as a DM, try to figure out the probabilities. If I wanted you to have a 70% chance of succeeding on 3d8 and you take the middle number no clue but anyway neat system still just as narrative um some really cool stuff where things would escalate uh so everyone starts off green and if you get too beat up you go into the yellow and then all your powers change you can still use your green powers but you get yellow powers um the other thing that's neat because it's sentinels of the multiverse the environment is a character that's in play and every round the environment goes at initiative at some initiative so like you pick initiative popcorn style which is where i pick who plays next that's what they call popcorn style initiative at some point someone has to pick the environment and the environment scales up so that replaces the doom pool system from marvel heroic but then really ties it to sentinels of the multiverse because in sentinels of the multiverse there's a, a turn in the card game where the environment goes so it's neat to see the rpg tie into that and that can escalate so if the environment hits yellow even if you're not beat up enough to be yellow now everyone can start using their yellow powers and it simulates that whole build up in a superhero game where at the beginning of the fight you kind of suck and you tend to start getting beat up and then in the middle of the fight you're really trying but then when you're near the end and you're almost defeated that's when your big powers come out right which simulates comic book 
style fights perfectly. Uh, I played Aeon Girl, who was literally three weeks old. So I got to play the naive girl who doesn't get humanity and just makes bad jokes and talks about how the team should work great together and aren't we doing awesome. So that was fun because I don't usually play very upbeat, happy characters. So that was a fun change. Uh, the mission Eric ran was, was interesting. There was all kinds of weird magic stuff going on. It was neat. Uh, really like the system though. So this is one, this is on my must buy list. Like I'm going to pick up a copy. So the thing is the game's not out yet. So he ran this. There's a kick, quick set, quick starter set rules that are out. They did a Kickstarter. I, as far as I know, that's funded and everything, but I totally missed that it even happened. And what Eric ran was a standalone thing they published, a standalone where you play the kids of the original heroes. So obviously they're trying to cash in on the whole, um, that DC, can't remember the name of it. Young Titans, Justice. I can't. Young Justice, yes, thank you. So obviously trying to do that. So Aeon Girl was, uh, we were doing a mission for Legacy's daughter, and Legacy's one of the big characters and everything. Very cool. I'm going to have to pick it up. Um, I noticed you can get it pretty cheap. I just haven't actually spent the money, and I'll definitely be looking for the full game when it comes out. I, a big thumbs up on that system. I totally want to try that now. Yeah. So at this point, I just headed back to base camp. Sean, I think if I remember after the last panel, you just headed home. Yeah, I uh, I trying to try to mix family and con that weekend. Yeah. So I uh, I called it a very early night. Yeah, I was planning on calling it an early night, but then I ran into Chris Groff, uh, who is someone from the Kitchener Waterloo area who I talk to online all the time. I was playing Destiny on PlayStation 4 with him quite a bit with him and his wife Monica. I ran into him and his friend Rob. I apologize, Rob, I can't remember your last name off the top of my head, but two great guys from Kitchener. Um, we just started chatting and chatting and chatting, and then we noticed it was like 1 a.m. So I didn't head back to the hotel till pretty late. Now, while Sean and I were doing all of this, Deanna was hanging out with her friend Aaron. Yeah, I noticed we're running long, so I'm going to be pretty quick with this. I went to Comic-Con. It was fun. There was crazy lineups. Doors don't open until 4 p.m. People were lined up outside by 3.30. Even with that, I think it took until 5 for my friend Aaron to get her pass. I technically had a press pass. I went there as press. Um, lots of cool cosplay. You actually feel weird being dressed as a normal human. Like, I didn't even have a cool t-shirt on. I was like, oh, I feel like I'm somebody's mom. This is embarrassing. Um, and we did the sketch panels, which everybody should know about because they are the coolest thing ever. Uh, Aaron brought me to one last year, and I thought, I don't know, I'm going to go to this sketch panel for three artists I've never heard of before. Like, isn't that for a hardcore fan? But you go and they're chatting and they're talking about uh it's like an ask me anything for artists right and they're chatting about really insider stuff for comics and they're all up there drawing and they draw silly things based on what the uh audience yells out and um like they did archie characters as superheroes and that was last year this year they did uh, conan at a hot dog stand and depression care bears but they're, they're sitting there and they're drawing while having this conversation and talking and making this really awesome art. And then they raffle it off and people in the audience could take the art home for free. So it was super fun. I love the sketch panels and everyone should go to sketch panels. And Comic-Con. Comic-Con's cool. But not as cool as Breakout. So that's it. <laughs> you got to try to fit in both. That's, yeah. that's, well, that's, that's the it. plan I for next dip. year, right? That's my plan for next year, too. I double dip. I get best of both worlds. There you go. All right, so yeah, for anyone watching, listening, this is going to be a long episode. I, the, the podcast is probably going to be long. we got a lot to talk about for Breakout. I think it's worth it, though, if you want to hear more about Breakout. I'm trying to decide, maybe we just cut off the whole end and talk about the games we played next week. Yeah, we can. I've got, nothing, I've got nothing special on there, so we can, we can drop that. Or I can go through it, and then we have it recorded either way. I don't know. Obviously, we're going long at this point. Because we're only on Saturday <laughs> so, of a three-day con. Though Sunday is pretty short. Um, so Saturday was the day all three of us were going to be at the con all day. Uh, started off, Deanna and I walked to Kiva's, all excited to get our breakfast sandwiches. And no, because Kiva's is only open during the week because we're in the financial district. Something that became a... Uh, Recurring problem throughout the weekend with things being closed, we expect to be open. Uh, so Deanna and I went to the ever popular Tim Hortons and had breakfast biscuits for breakfast. A little disappointing, but hey, at least it's quick. Um, Saturday for me was my RPG day. Uh, I had a game starting at 10, then another right after. So I was literally booked all day till 6 p.m. playing RPGs. Uh, the first RPG I played was High Plains Samurai Legends. 
This was run by the writer and designer himself, Todd Crapper, the man with the best name in gaming. Uh, this it was a weird game. I don't even know how to describe it. It was a mashup of Fallout, Fist of the North Star, Mad Max, Akira Kurosawa movies with some steampunk and then some John Woo-like gangsters. Um, probably about 20 other meshes of things altogether. So now the one thing I did notice all these things have in common is action. These are, this is a very action oriented stuff blowing up, stuff getting shot, people with katanas kind of game. Uh, really hard to describe. Uh, it's, it's post-apocalyptic for sure. This is, you're out in the wasteland. The Wasteland is run by, I'm not going to remember how many off the top of my head because I don't have the notes, but say five different villages of people and in the middle of the Badlands, there's a whole story about the gods and how the, the All-Father tried to destroy the world but failed. Whatever, lots of stuff going on. Tied to this is a very narrative, very tight, very scripted system. Um, it had a very fate kind of feel where you have approaches, which are like your high whatever it's called in fate, high, whatever, your, your main aspect. Um, you have two approaches that you're going to have, and it's how your character approaches the world, and it's a sentence or a word, right? Very fate-like. That determines the dice you're going to use, but it also determines the number of details you are allowed to add when narrating. And that's how the game plays, is you just start narrating stuff. Now, you're narrating stuff not just for you, but also the other players. So it is totally valid to say the three of us run down the roof of the train, I leap across as uh, Straw leaps behind me, and then this person stays behind to guard, and that's all legit to say. And as you're doing this, Todd is sitting there counting off how many de declarations you've made. Uh, and you're only allowed certain numbers. So if you're using your main approach, you're allowed three. So he's like, wait, you're moving down the train. That's one, because you move spots. Um, this person staying behind, that's two. And then he'd be like, okay, you still get one more declaration. So very scripted. What's odd, it was also somehow free, which reminds me of when we played Mouse Guard for the first time, where I'm like, man, Luke Crane really wants you to play this a certain way, but by playing it that way, it really worked. Um, I don't, it, it's weird. Uh, you're going to roll dice, and if you beat the opponent, what you wanted happens. And what happens then is a complication happens. Now, if you fail, the complication's on you. And then, in a really odd twist, depending if you're rolled even or odd on the dice, determines who gets to set what that complication is. So you can succeed, but the DM gets to determine what the complication is on the NPC you were acting on. Or you could fail, and you get to set the complication that happens to yourself. Like, odd. It, it, it's almost past the stick improv, but then you throw in constraints to the, what you're allowed to say, and then you throw in a really traditional dice-rolling DM player thing with difficulty classes. Like, it, odd, unique system. I, I liked it. It was, it was very different. Uh, I liked it enough that by the time I left the con, I bought the book. So that's one good thing. In a way, to also help support Todd, because Todd's awesome. Uh, I really think people should try this game. Uh, from what Todd mentioned on Twitter, you can get High Plains Legends... High Plains Samurai Legends free on Drive-Thru RPG. And I think it's worth checking out if you're a game designer or you play RPGs just to read his resolution system because I've never seen anything quite like it. It's a very cool setting, but I don't think that narrative style would appeal to me at all. I don't like dictating what other people's characters are doing. It makes me uncomfortable. I'm old school. <laughs> yeah. And I just dropped the link into the chat. Uh, and again, the watermarked PDF is free. Yep. So, you can yeah, Todd that mentioned now. that. Todd mentioned that after I bought it off him, of course. <laughs> <laughs> I did get the physical book, though. Yeah, makes a, yeah, you know, a good RPG has to be physical, you know. The little yeah. quick con games are great uh, in PDF form, but uh, you can't beat a good, solid, soft cover. I agree. Uh, I agree. I even prefer, I even actually prefer soft cover, like a hefty soft cover that flops around a little bit. I don't know, it's just me. These are soft covers, so. Entries all the way. Yep. So while I was playing High Plains Samurai, what were you two up to? Uh, so we actually spent most of the morning playing games to start off with. Uh, yeah. Deanna, I... Deanna introduced me to Suburbia, my first for the my for the first time. Yeah, I dragged Sean to the board game room, and I'm like, let's pick out a game I can easily teach you. Let's see, Suburbia. Yeah, I know that one. And then I grabbed it, and I opened it up, and went, I haven't played this in like two years. 
Mm, okay, let's look at the rule book for a minute here. <laughs> and we kind well, of screwed up a few things, but we sorted it out pretty quick. Yes, we what was nice? Extreme. What was nice was it was really well packaged. Like, that was one, one thing I found about the library. So everything was really nicely packaged in uh, Tupperware boxes. And mm -hmm. they actually had included a quick start setup rules summary. So I'd never played the game before. And while D was uh, uh, going through the rules and seeing it, I was able to set up the whole game, never having opened a box before. I had it like half set up as she was sort of, you know, flipping through the rules to. Uh, so that was great. I have to say that the library and, and uh, the library there seems really well organized and really well managed. Um, yeah, it was so. separated out into little plano boxes. The other thing that was awesome was the board game ambassadors in the board game room were amazing. Like, a guy came around to our table as Sean and I were setting up, and he's like, do you guys want more players? Are you? Do you need someone to teach you the rules? And we're like, no, we're good. We're just going to have a learning game, just the two of us. But the fact that somebody came by and checked, you know, that was cool. And, um, yeah, and so we played two rounds of that because we had to get the rules right, right. for the second round. <laughs> So yeah, I think what, I think almost all the games had the inserts we mentioned on the podcast before the esoteric order of gamers. Mm -hmm. They had gone and printed off the sheets yep. from that, which is something I do for all our. We don't have cons, but like when I do a great Canadian board game blitz, I do the same thing. It's definitely a, an awesome resource. Like they put out some of the best player summaries I've ever seen, and the games I saw had those in there. So I'm assuming it was probably the same way. Yeah, no, it was fantastic. Uh, my my problem with the gaming room was really sort of the space. Um, and I'm not sure of what the solution is. Uh, it was it was fantastic. And I mean, it was really busy and they used all their tables. But unfortunately, they used all their tables. And I don't think they really thought clearly about aisle space. They thought about, okay, I can fit all these tables in and all these chairs in and I can get, you know, 800 or 1,200 people into this room. And then they forgot that board gamers carry stuff. Yeah. Um, and, 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 you know, as horrible as it may be, board gamers on, myself included, are sometimes larger people. Um, and so tables need a little bit more space. Uh, and I, I know we noticed even that very first day when the room wasn't full, they put a table directly yeah. in front of the library. That was bad. And it was horribly awkward because yeah. if there was anyone at that table or if there was anyone at the library, you couldn't get by unless it was a, a, a you know, Canadian, excuse me, pardon me, excuse me, sorry, I'm sorry I bumped you, I'm sorry I just slapped you in the head with a sharp corner of a <laughs> board game box. Yeah. Um, there was just no way around it. Yeah, so, I had my giant camera bag and I, I really felt like I was attacking people everywhere I went. So the aisles yeah. did need a little more space. I, I would love to see, uh, you know, some method of, of, you know, take a couple of tables or a few tables out of that uh, and then put more interest into that backup board game room. Because I suspect that backup board game room wasn't overly used. I, I no. didn't get over there to be more sure. Space. But if they, if they could have sort of, you know, dropped the table count in the main room a little bit and helps people get over to that other room, it would have been a more comfortable uh, situation for everybody involved. There should have been a big sign in the main board game hall that said Overflow Gaming here with a, mm -hmm. with a sign. Now, yeah. that's something that hasn't come up yet, but that is something that was way big better this year is there were signs with maps everywhere. There that was something that didn't exist this year. And every room had a sign telling you what was in it, which was also fantastic. But there wasn't really anywhere anything in the rooms to tell you where else to go. So the other thing I noticed was an awful lot of kids in that big gaming hall, despite the fact there was that awesome family gaming room. And I think in most cases, people probably didn't know that existed. That they, they, they could have had a much quieter place to play with their kids, plus a much more kid-friendly gaming library, all right there accessible. Plus that family room, uh, half the games in there were play to win. And not that the kids can't be in the regular room, but the family room is definitely mostly empty every time I walked by it. Yeah. And it had a great and the light, overflow gaming room on library. Friday, I didn't see a single person using it on... S Sorry, D cut up again, and I didn't realize I was talking over you. My bad. I'm not talking. <laughs> all right over in um sorry the backup gaming room i did notice it was used on saturday but like i think i saw five tables in there and that's it so um yeah it was a little word should have been out it, it 
people needed to know those rooms existed. Though I, that maybe people didn't want to split off too. Maybe they wanted to be where everyone else was. But I did notice um, Major Kayla noted that the main board game room was a little too peoply. That is where that overflow room would have been perfect. Yep. And the other thing is she noted that Oh, and her husband was finding it hard to find games to get into. And the one thing, those, those board ambassadors, if you could figure out who was who, but even if you just walked up to the main table and you said, hey, I really want to play Root, they'd find you someone to play Root with. Like, they were really good for that. So that's something to, to try next year. Which, again, leads me to the point of that needs to be communicated better. Yes. There, there should be, I don't know, signs somewhere that say, hey, looking for a game, come ask here. Or the big well, game ambassadors should have signs. I don't know. I, I don't know what the solution is, but just a way to communicate that info better. Maybe perhaps like they did for the safety ambassadors by having a card on every table. Maybe in the board game room, have a card on every table that says where to get the signs that say, hey, I'm looking for a teacher. How to get a hold of a board game ambassador. And hey, if there's no room here, head over over there. So there were they they did have uh, signs for the tables that said looking for players, and I believe it was the board gaming ambassadors that brought those around. Like when they okay. came and asked us if we'd said yes, we'd like a player, they would have put a sign down. But we noticed, I guess last year they had those signs raised yeah, up really tall. Whereas yeah, this they year they were just on like a recipe stand, so you had to you know from any distance at all you couldn't see that there was a sign there you so had to you really walk up had to that to table walk up and down and again the aisles were lovely because i i went yeah. around that yeah, room last about year it was a lot easier to see the signs. what i saw this year a lot more of was people holding up a game like just mm -hmm. standing there holding up a game in the air obviously I'm, I'm assuming that meant looking for flares um there was a note from mcganth who noted there were two other smaller spillover gaming halls close to the one. Yeah, those did get used. City Hall was one of the big rooms. I did see people using that room. But again, if you wanted a quiet space, the one that was down the hall... Now, it was. It was way down the hall. Yep. Like, I, I for a gaming area, it was a bit of a walk. Uh, another bonus, too, that was worth noting is this year you could take games out. Like, you could check them out. And if you really wanted to, go play it in your hotel room, right? As long as you checked it back. And you could check out games overnight, which was an advantage this year. Not something I used, but there was more overnight gaming available. Yeah, the, uh, yeah so the, the City Hall room was, was available for overnight gaming. Or you mm -hmm. could bring it back to your room and just have it back by 9 a.m. the next day. Yeah, which is a cool bonus. Again, I didn't take anyone up on this, but I think it's awesome that it was available. So, so while you guys... Some gaming, you were off. Yeah, I was off on my second RPG. This was Tales from the Loop. Uh, this was run by the magnificent Angela Murray, uh, now one of the head gnomes at Gnome Stew. Uh, this was a pretty cool adventure. It was a mystery, which I think probably every Tales from the Loop game is a mystery. I think that's kind of part of the, the thing is you're trying to solve something. Um... This one really reminded me of Batteries Not Included. There were little robots that were messing with things. Our tech was all broken when we got up in the morning. Uh, I played the Rocker. Uh, I gotta say, though, it, for whatever reason, it just wasn't as good as my previous Tales from the Loop game. Now, I had played once before with Sean at uh, QCC. Um, playing under... I'm drawing a blank on the name. It may come to me later. Um... And this was no fault of Ange's at all. Ange is a fantastic GM. I had played with her in the past. Great GM overall. But for some reason, we just weren't invested. Now, Sean and I talked about it at the end of the night, before he was going home on Saturday, just about what the differences were between the two games. And I think it's because in Ange's game, we didn't do group character generation. And the other thing was hideout creation. So part of the, the game, you're playing kids on bikes, right? And you have a secret hideout. Well, in our last game, we got to pick. What, where were they, they, the DM said to us, so where's your hideout? What's it look like? What's there? Where Ange's was, you guys have a hideout. It looks like this. And we all did get to add one touch to the hideout. So we had some investment. Uh, it just wasn't as tight as I'd liked. I, and, and the people I played with just didn't seem, they seemed to be playing normal people. We didn't get a big, we're playing kids vibe from this one. So I still digged it. it. It was okay. But the last time I played Tales from the Loop, I ran out and bought a copy because it was amazing. This time, it, it was an okay experience. Again, no fault of the DMs. Ange ran a great game. It was just a mix of people and little less investment in the game from the beginning. And so uh, while you were uh, doing that, uh, 
D, where did you go after board gaming? Because I went off and started doing panels. Where did you head off well, I to? decided I should probably do the media thing, and I went and checked out the family room and took some pictures, and I went and looked at the Bring It By auction, which made me weep that I did not have money because there was a lot of cool vintage stuff in there. Some of it sealed, and there was just a lot of crazy good deals on board games. So I walked through that and took a look around, and then... You were at a panel, and what did I do? Oh, I went back to the board game room, and I played games with strangers. Uh, yeah. So, I played Dominion of all things. Because, again, you're walking up and down, and you're just looking for somebody that's got a game going, right? So I'm like, meh, Dominion. I hadn't played it since it first came out. I still didn't like it. But uh, when we were done Dominion, one of the people at the table had just bought a copy of Mint Works off of someone at the con. And so he, he broke that out, and uh, we all figured out how to play it together. And Mintworks is this wee little game that's in, like, a mint tin, and it's a worker placement game. So it was it was uh, simple, quick. It was neat. I actually really liked it. Um, no, I did not see a custom Dominion Lazy Susan. I've got it in one of my pictures. One of the pictures I shared for the board game room. I think it's on the blog post with the wrap out of Breakout Con. Yeah, someone had this giant void Lazy Susan with spots for all the cards. So the wow. one thing the one thing that was cool about that game that I played at Dominion was that it was with a couple whose names I'm not going to remember who were just staying at the hotel, found out that the con was going on, and ended up buying a pass and coming and spending the day there and they were having a really good time they were like That's this awesome. is great we are coming back next year so that was neat i think my favorite picture of the con was still the picture of the dad holding his infant child while learning how to play uh codenames duos uh, <laughs> in the uh, in the board game room uh, so while you were uh, in- enjoying uh, the company of strangers and uh, and playing dominion I was up, and uh, I was at uh, running a good con RPG. Now, this was moderated by Senda. This was one of the uh, the gnome panels. Uh, and Camden, Angela Murray, and uh, Chris Spivy were all uh, on that one. And it was a fantastic panel. I mean, there are, there are a great bunch of people in. I mean, we all know, we know them all, and, and they were uh, a delight. But uh, it was really great uh, hearing... They're, they're, you know, guys who have run, guys, girls, people who have run a significant number of games uh, at cons of all different types, too. It's not like they were all just mm-hmm. uh, trad RPGers or, uh, you know, modern RPGers. They've, they've all run many kind. Chris runs a 12 person plus uh, shadow run game at home. And I mean, Camden runs One Child's Heart. So, mm-hmm. you know, you don't really get much, uh, much separate. It was. Um, it was, it was a very, uh, interesting panel. And I got to say, Camden is just fantastic on panels. Uh, and, and then, and then Camden mm-hmm. and Chris interacting together, uh, with Senda sort of overseeing and reining them in every once in a while. <laughs> uh, I think as, as a panel with the moderator and panelists interacting and actual moderation, it was probably one of my favorites. Uh, I, I, uh, I don't know if my when or when or if my article is ever going to come out on on the blog, but one of my problems with the the panels uh, was I f- I found the moderators. Uh, in many cases, the moderators were there uh, and either wanted to be a panelist and and took part as if they were a panelist, mm. or sort of sat back and didn't um, didn't moderate anything, just kind of let people talk and. Uh, right. Or or threw out some questions and pointed at people in the audience, but didn't actively moderate anything uh, and guide or direct anything. And I think um, as much as I understand that at an RPG con, most of what happens is, you know, your moderators are esteemed guests, right? They are people mm-hmm. who are, are well known and in part they're there to draw more people to the panel, uh, but they're also there as a reward. Um, but I feel like some having some actual moderators who were skilled at moderating a panel uh, and had those specific skills of, of, of guiding and, and directing random people who want to chat about what they love um, would have benefited uh, some of the panels who didn't have that. So the, the first panel of every con should be how to moderate a panel and all the moderators <laughs> need to go to that panel. There we go. <laughs> there you go. <laughs> That's the secret. Yeah. 
I wonder if the, I know Breakout, this is something none of us took part in, but they had a mentorship program going on that sounded fascinating. There was uh, at least a board game one and an RPG one where you actually sat down and designed the games with, oh, we lost Anna again. We'll see if she comes back. <laughs> I apologize for our again, Wi-Fi. I have no there clue why it dropped me. She's back. Yeah. You're back. All right, sorry guys. All right, anyway, there there was mentorship. I'm not going to talk much on it because I might get the information wrong. But basically, you had industry insiders meeting with um, independent new developers working on like literally playtesting games, literally producing games. Like uh, from what I understand, Senda ran one of the RPG ones, and they sat down and wrote an RPG during this whole mentorship. Now I don't know how long these ran. I know there was a room dedicated to it, but it seems very cool. And I almost wonder if one of the mentorships should be on panel hosting, moderating, running a panel, something like that. Seems like it might be a useful topic. Heck, I'd like to go to one on how to moderate a panel. Because uh, like Sean, I didn't go to very many panels this year, but I went to a ton last year, and the quality of the panel was definitely definitely affected by the ability of the moderator absolutely uh, so for me up after the running a good comar gg was board game lingo uh and now given who we are and what we've done in our episodes i felt <laughs> yeah, I pretty appropriate that, one covered. that i should go to this and and partially i wanted to go and and, and feel proud when i knew everything um and so there was there was definitely an, an aspect of that in there but also i was just interested because there was a good chance i didn't know everything i mean yeah. if if Mo had gone, I would have expected him to know everything, but I'm still the newer one here. So even I, then I'm still learning. I, I, I was looking to learn. Now this was an interesting panel uh, because it had an interesting uh, group of attendees. Uh, now, Daryl Andrews, uh, the, the gentleman from Sagrada I mentioned earlier was the host. Uh, and you know, he's a great guy and he's really knowledgeable, but his uh, panelists were Terry Alitorco, Mandy Hutchinson, and Helena Capel, and Terry and Mandy are big people. They are big personalities, uh, and they even brought their own press. Uh, <laughs> and so they really kind of ran the panel um, a little bit away from. I mean, Daryl was Daryl wasn't didn't lose control, but it was it was definitely Terry and Mandy's panel, mm -hmm. and uh, Helena was a quieter person, and I, I felt I felt bad for her because she got a little. Uh, a little railroaded. Over. Yeah. Uh, they they were good. They did include her. I mean, they did stop and turn to her, but I think it was sort of more of an afterthought. So, uh, uh, but they actually did a very good job. Uh, given the time they had, they went through and uh, and and punched through a long list. Uh, they just literally had a list. They went through in alphabetical order. Um, <laughs> Kind of like our game mechanics list. Yeah, basically. Yeah. Uh, although they didn't focus as much on mechanics. It was just general yeah. terms in general. Mm -hmm. um, and then it, uh, it was interesting. And I, I, I'm i sort of iffy on, on, on whether it was interesting, good or interesting, bad. But uh, Terry really took and, and sort of went with the game, the tabletop gaming, uh, tabletop warfare uh, version of everything. So mm -hmm. there was, uh, you know, Mandy being a, a heavy gamer herself. Uh, was really up on what would be a board the board game version of it, uh, and then Terry would take it and run and how that term was used in the tabletop warfare. Uh, yeah, miniature. She's a miniature, miniature board gamer. Yeah, yeah. And so and so that was uh, board game lingo. So I think at that point we all met up uh, at base camp, as we mentioned multiple times. This is where everyone meets up every night. Uh, and it was time to eat. So there was a group of us, we had a small army of us, all left at once because someone, I think it was Eric, had found a local wood-fired pizza place that wasn't too far away. So we made the trek down there. It was a little further than he expected based on the thing. Tech is complaining that I'm echoing. I got nothing. You're not echoing on any of my system. I don't know. <laughs> Weird. Because there's no one else in the room and there's no way D's audio is picking me up. Hopefully it sounds good in the uh, the podcast. We apologize for those of you live. By the time it gets on YouTube, the audio tracks will be edited out with our audacity, which is all locally recorded. So I do apologize. I'm not sure what I could possibly do to fix it. I don't know. We are trying something new with three people. So anyway... Dinner, pizza place, a uh, little longer walk than we expected. Uh, we got there and then found out it would be a minimum hour and a half wait to two hour wait. So that was a no. 
Uh, then someone grabbed their phone, they Googled something, and we tried to find a burger place. Uh, the Wear Gator, do not trust the Wear Gator for instructions. Do not give him the map, at least when he's in a foreign country. Maybe in the U.S. he's great. That didn't go so good. We wandered a bit further than we should have, which I feel bad because we had some people with mobility issues with us. Uh, but eventually, we were standing in front of a Duke bar. So in Toronto, there's a chain of bars, the Duke of, and they're all over the place. And Sean took us to the Duke of Richmond last year, and it was pretty good. So we're standing there trying to find this burger place. I'm like, look, there's the Duke of Westminster, like right there down the stairs. Why don't we check this out? And everyone agreed, and we went down there. And I got to say, that was fortuitous. Like, that was one of the best meals of the con. Really great pub food. Like, pure pub food, like your bangers and mash, your, your Britian beans, your shepherd's pie, all that good stuff. Really great beer selection. Overstaffed to the I almost swore overstaffed like crazy because it was St. Patrick's Day weekend, but no one was actually there. Uh, there was an amusing scene where Sean walked ahead and the staff got up and looked excited by seeing him like, oh my God, he might come in. So yeah, that was, was pretty we, good. We literally, someone said, hey, why don't we go look and see if they have any room? And I took a few to steps down, down the stairs and I said, I think so because they are all staring at me through the window. Yes. And like excitedly, <laughs> like like puppy dogs, like they want to be adopted, right? It like was, they were so happy to see us. Was, uh, we had a great meal. Uh, they treated us well. They were really good. Uh, there was one complaint that that place is not very accessible. So if you do have someone with you that, that requires handicapped seating or something like that, don't go there. But as long as everyone is perfectly abled, uh, I strongly recommend the place. Um, McGaneth in the chat is even noting that that's where all the suits go for, for pub food. So, yeah, I, I actually like that place way better than the Duke of Richmond, there even though I know it's all the same chain. There had to be a stair-free way to get in and out of that place, but we couldn't find it. Even though the staff tried to yeah, describe it. Yeah, and it was almost it. all bar seating, too, so it yeah. wasn't normal seats, which was another problem with it. Yeah. Because we even asked, uh, someone there even asked if they had, like, normal tables, and they do not. But overall, good place. Uh, one other complaint, they close at one, not two, which is frustrating from someone from Windsor. No, I'm No, downstairs. and she games on a different floor, so I have no idea why that is happening. Duke of Westminster, Major Kayla was asking. Not the Duke of Wellington. So you'll see Jerry Myers was with us. He shared online that we are at the Duke of Wellington. We were not. We were at the Duke of Westminster, which, again, I found out late at night because the Duke of Wellington knows open till 2. <laughs> and I had the two mixed. So anyway, good good food. Uh, after that, we went back to the con. I had my final RPG of the day. Like I said, Saturday was my RPG day. Uh, this was finally getting to play Dungeon World under Chris Nizak, something he has promised me since Origins two years ago. Uh, this was my first game of Dungeon World. Um, I don't think it was a great example of that system. We had a rather non-traditional party uh, that did not really get along, which is, I think, probably a problem for that kind of game. Um, we had two comedic dwarves who literally kind of played like a whole Laurel and Hardy act where one was the straight man and one was the comedy and they kept going off each other. I got to admit, it was funny. We laughed. Um, we had an elf ranger in the group who had a wolf named Symphony. Um, and then I played an immolator, which is a fire mage. And I was just a bit of a pyromaniac, just a little bit. Um, because of this, the game went rather gonzo which I think was to some of Chris's chagrin. I don't think he wanted to run a Gonzo game, but because of the group and the fact we did group party creation and we all did it all at once, uh, that's how it ended up. I'll admit it was fun. Like we had a good game. We laughed. Um, if Chris was running legacy games, there's a whole part of his airy peaks that are now on fire. And you guys no longer have to worry about the mushroom army because it's all been burnt to a crisp and it smells really good in there now. Uh, but it wasn't quite what I was expecting from a game that's supposed to emulate OSR, like old school role playing. It's supposed to feel like an old school dungeon brawl. That wasn't the game we played. Um, but again, uh, no fault to Chris. I'm not, not throwing the DM under the bus here. It was a good game. I had a good game. It just wasn't quite what I expected it to be. Now that didn't end till 1 a.m. At 1 a.m. at that point, I went to the, I wanted a beer, uh, Chris and I. That's the one thing we found at this con. I, I like my beer and i like at cons to go for a beer with a big group of people and everyone has a couple drinks and relaxes a bit right it's a little less stuffy sometimes people say stuff they wouldn't have said otherwise you know lubricate the social situation i enjoy that aspect of say origins that is not a breakout thing now that's not a hack against breakout but most other cons i go to 
at the end of the night, you tend to head to a local pub and have a few drinks. Well, you can't really do that in Toronto because we're in the financial district. And for whatever reason, there's no businessmen around at that time. So all the bars close. So that was a little disappointing. It, it's an aspect of con going that I do enjoy. I know some people are not a fan of that, but to each their own. I personally was disappointed. Chris was disappointed. After the Dungeon World game, we wanted to go for a drink and couldn't find anywhere to do so. I'm going to yeah, be no, like it's, uh, it's, it's a great location for so many reasons. Yeah, it's a great location for so many reasons, but uh, but yeah, the, the, the business aspect of it is there. But yes, D and I definitely both have to rewind time here. Well, you yeah, first, because I actually I have no ahead. clue what you did after dinner, Sean. Uh, well, I actually left after dinner, so I really have to rewind time. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> okay, my bad. Yeah, no, no, that's fine. Uh, because uh, we our panels were actually before the, the panels I did were before dinner, and then we came down. Uh, we came down after the panel that D and I uh, both uh, went and saw, and fr and went to dinner after that. Hmm. Um, but the next panel I was at was actually Jen's panel. Um, and she was so excited because she was doing her first panel, and it was it was great. Um, that was her first time moderating, right? Yeah. And yeah. you know what? It was a good panel. I was disappointed, and again, this goes to the titling of it. Um, the title of it was Online Tabletop Gaming, and we do a lot of that. We play Board Game Arena. We talk about every week, and uh, we're looking at, uh, looking at a few different other options um, for different uh, gaming solutions online that we want to talk about and see what else we can do. I know we've talked about uh, a few different options that are out there. And this wasn't about that at all. Um, this this was very much about online RPG, period. Uh. Um, and so it was fine. Uh, it was it was a good discussion about online RPG, um, but it, it wasn't about tabletop gaming. It was about RPG. Uh, so I I, I, I I left that one a little bit disappointed. Um, but again, it, it was of no fault of Jen's. I think she ran the panel she needed to run. Uh, the title misled me personally because of what I think of as tabletop gaming. Yeah, to me, tabletop gaming is both, right? Yeah. Well, actually, even more inclusive would also include miniature gaming. Yeah. Which I, which I have to assume there's online miniature gaming. That must happen. Oh yeah, absolutely. I mean, tabletop. Well, tabletop uh, simulator is a uh, you know does everything. So yeah. Uh, um, and there was some interesting uses. Like I know they were talking about the um, the R twenty uh, roll twenty system roll 20. and using that even at a tabletop game where you're in the same room using um, the roll twenty uh, because they have fog of war systems. So you mm -hmm. can actually use do the mapping uh, do the mapping through. Uh, roll 20 and get the advantage of the fog of war without having to worry about doing something crazy on your table and, and, you know, playing with, uh, manual ways of it. Mm -hmm. So, uh, and then, uh, D came up and joined me for the last panel that I went to for the day, uh, and for the con actually, uh, because it had the fantastic title. I have to say this one won because of the title, uh, it was the top 10 old board games or top 10 old games board games everyone should play. Right. Um, now, I think some of these people are a little younger than I expected, so the term <laughs> old may have been a little misleading, but it was a really interesting discussion, uh, and it was primarily aimed at old games that designers should play. So yes, sure. everyone everyone should play these, but these are games that these were games that were historical in that they introduced the meeple or they introduced this mechanic or they are the best example of this mechanic, uh, or you know this game combined a bunch of things in a really unique way that no one else has mm -hmm. done or that you know look at this and so there were five uh, people up on the um, up there so it was. Uh, uh, Daryl Andrews again, John Gilmore, John Butterfield, and Erica Hayes uh, Bouguerese with uh, Nicole Hoy um, moderating. Uh, but she kind of stood back because the the four the the four people on the panel had their lists mm -hmm. and they had fifty five minutes to get through them, and that was not enough time. <laughs> uh, 
So I don't know. Do you, you want to talk a little bit well, more yeah, about that? Well, yeah. No, I have to say I really enjoyed that panel. And I was kind of like, hmm, top 10 old games. First off, I thought that they were going to discuss 10 games total, not 10 games per panelist. They really managed to squeeze oh, wow. a lot in. Oh, yeah. And their reasoning, like you said, everything was, this is why this game was seminal to me personally or to the field as a whole, right? And it was fascinating. It was actually really good stuff. Yeah, no, it was fantastic. And I mean, they even had, they even brought out samples. They had uh, like a 19, like really early 1980s game uh, box on, sitting up on the table. And, uh, you know, I think I, I most of the games I was familiar with, at least in some manner, but uh, I'd have to check my list again. But I think they even managed to pull out some games where I'm like, what the heck is that? Um, nice. A lot, but a lot, again, a lot of it was stuff we have talked about numerous times. Mm -hmm. uh, you know, you're... Um, you know, the Carcassonne, origin, Carcassonne is the origin of Meeple, Catan mm -hmm. as what it is, uh, you know, the auction system from Power, power uh, Grid. Power yeah, grid, the Power yeah. Grid auction. Yeah, so, you know, a lot of that stuff was in there, but hearing everyone's individual take, and it was also interesting, and the reason they, the only reason they managed to get through all of their lists was um, there were Crossover. a number of games, yeah, there were a number of games mm -hmm. where someone... You know, whoever was speaking first that round would would say a game, and then five people would immediately start scratching out things and grumbling <laughs> and complaining um, because they they didn't get to talk about it. So, uh, you know, it was really an interesting and fun yeah. panel uh, that I, that really was, I think, an important history lesson about board games, even if some of the games they were talked about were from like 2013. Yes. <laughs> yeah. Um. Yeah, I was surprised when they were like, "So this seminal game from five years ago," and I'm like. What? No, old, old. Uh, maybe the first half of that panel, I was like, I have played every game they're talking about. I think every one of them is in this basement, right? And then they got into stuff that I was like, oh, oh, I've never heard of that. Oh, that sounds interesting. So, no, it was a good mix. I really enjoyed it. Yep. So you wanted to back up on something, Deanna? Oh, yeah. So I was going to talk about how after dinner, I went and played um, Long Live the Queen. Because I was in an off-the-books game with uh, Phil Vecchion and Eric Weregator and Bob Misdirected Mark, Old Man Logan and Senda. So that's like the A-team of role-playing games. Like I had the... It was awesome. That game is super fun. It's still in uh, pre-production. Long Live the Queen. It's a uh, time-traveling. So Kronos Corp is the, the bad guys that have come back in time and they're strip mining the past for resources and so to woo the people in the past into giving them all this useless stuff like what is this chronium or whatever like people what do you need that for um, you know the black oil or whatever um, so they they come in and they give people iPhones and electricity and all this stuff and so you have the Musketeers time period with King Louis with iPhones and electricity and birth control and the Catholic Church is actually on the outs and the Inquisition is one of the forces that we're fighting against and everyone is playing um, the Queen's carnations, the Queen's like we are the Queen's personal spy group and it's all females that are part of the court and it's a really super fun game i can't wait till it goes to production are they kickstartering that do you know they've started pre-orders on it i don't really i certainly hadn't heard that i thought he was still still getting some kinks out of it like the the um I had played it at QCC, and he had tweaked some of the rules and stuff, and it, it, it's definitely it's smooth now. So it's a really enjoyable game, and I had a super fun time, and I got to replay my character that I played at QCC, the Patient Spider. It was fun. And that was uh, that was it for me for the con. I actually stepped away. Uh, I had a uh, family birthday on uh, Sunday, so... I said my goodbyes uh, to probably not enough people because, again, I'm a horrible uh, social mess and, and don't do that well. But uh, <laughs> slipped away into the night and disappeared uh, to allow you guys to uh, enjoy your Sunday. Yeah, I was uh, I was done with Long Live the Queen by like 10.30. So then I went back to base camp for a bit and then I was like, I am not just sitting here until 1. I'm going to go crazy because it was a little people-y. They're all good people, but I don't know most of them and I'm like, hmm. 
So what am I going to do till one in the morning? I'm like, there's board games. So I went to the board game room and like Mo said, they let you check games out overnight. So I went and got out a ca- uh, copy of Castles of Mad King Ludwig. And then I went and got Major Kayla and her husband. And we went into City Hall, which is open for late night gaming. And we played Castles of Mad King Ludwig. And again, I'm thinking, I know this game pretty good. I could teach this. This will be good. And then I open it and I'm like, hmm. Better than Suburbia. I had played it much more recently than Suburbia, but still not 100% in my brain. So I'm like, "Mm, 82%. And so while we're setting it up, some gentleman whose name I'm not going to remember came up and was watching us for a bit. And he's like, oh, do you mind if I join you? And he knew that game. He knew that game backwards and forwards. And he was like, you do this, sit up like this, play like this, da da da. So that was nice because we had the guide through Castles of Mad King moved week there. And uh, I played that and that was fun. And that wrapped up just about when Mo's um, Dungeon World game was wrapping up. Mm-hmm. We were actually in the same room. I could have thrown something at him. And uh, and then we went out and tried to find beer. And I was very, very frustrated by the lack of beer. It's St. Patrick's Day weekend on a Saturday night at 1am and we couldn't find an open bar. That's crazy. Yeah. Yep. Yeah, Major Kayla said his name was K- K- Kevin and uh, that's probably right because I'm very bad with names. So moving on to Sunday, <laughs> two hours in, uh, Deanna went back to Comic-Con for a bit. Uh, Sean, as he noted, was doing family stuff at home, so I was on my own. Um, having to decide what to do for breakfast, I made the mistake of hitting up the Shopsies. Just in general, just don't eat at the hotel premise, as far as I can tell. Um, overpriced, limited menu. Limited menu enough that I got an omelet and I couldn't get white toast. White The toast was not an option. You got what they gave you. And I swear they just, like, nuked my omelet. It came out so quick. But anyway, bad I, bad experience at Shopsies. I can't believe you went back to Shopsies, because we had dinner there last year, and you said you were not going to eat there. You were absolutely, I'm not eating at Shopsies this year. And then you went there. Someone, someone that we know said they had good breakfast, so I was going on that. And there's many places locally here in Windsor that have great breakfast, terrible dinner. And I thought that's what that's it fair. was, was I thought I was going to get a good breakfast. Now, they had set up some kind of buffet in the Sheraton Center, like in that atrium area we hung out. I should have asked how much that was, because maybe that would have been better. But anyway, bad breakfast. I don't know. Um, I, I think after QCC, you should stay away from hotel breakfasts. Oh, that was <laughs> That was terrible. Just... That, uh, yeah. I don't. I've also had some really good buffet breakfast. Like this had an omelet station, unlike that thing at QCC. That was. Yeah. They're they're no longer at that venue, so I don't say feel bad for cutting. I I don't remember what that was. What chain? It wasn't Sheraton. Whatever it was, that was that was the worst. Like I can't believe how much we paid for that garbage. Anyway, Shopsies better than that. Um, so I was almost late for my first game due to Shopsies issues. Um. They didn't even give me a refill on my coffee. Like, who doesn't offer a refill on your coffee when you're having breakfast? But anyway, uh, and I went to my first game. Now, this was a protocol RPG called Desperation of Atlantis. Now, protocol is Jim Pinto's very improv story-driven system uh, that he's put out. Like, I think he did a Kickstarter to release 100 RPGs or something like that, or 365, like he was going to write a different RPG every day. I don't know. This is Jim's big project, something he believes very strongly in. And this was one of those settings called Desperation of Atlantis. And I guess all of them are based on the same protocol system. I'd never played one of these before. Uh, This was facilitated by the awesome Wen Rachel. Um, he ran a fantastic game. Uh, this was a setting where Athens is at war with Atlantis and Atlantis had just stolen the relic. Um, you, the group is all playing Atlantean nobles or like the high court, important people in Atlantean society. Uh, it was a very group character creation thing where one just ran, ran, listed off a bunch of the different character types and we each picked one. Uh, Then we had a whole creation system where we created the relic ourselves and um, very unique game. A ton of role playing. I got to admit this game is, is almost as far out of my wheelhouse as one child's heart. Uh, was something that I only signed up because one was running and I talked to QCC I uh, talked to Wen at QCC years ago, and we talked about how at some point I had to play under one of his games. So this was me fulfilling that obligation, playing under one of Wen's games. But man, what a what a weird game, and not very different from what I'm used to. 
Uh, sorry, I got distracted by the chat. So I was going to say, oh yeah, so I went to Comic-Con Sunday morning and it made me want to go back to Comic-Con only on Sunday because um, my friend Aaron needed to pick up a ticket again and this time it took like five minutes. We walk, we waltzed in, we got a ticket, we waltzed on into the, the demo room and it was empty, not empty empty, but compared to Friday, empty. And I'm like, oh, I'm coming back Sunday next year. This is nice. Uh, so that was it. I was at Comic-Con for like 30 minutes and then I had to turn around and leave and hightail it to get to, uh, the Sheridan in time for my game at noon. I was playing a fifth ed Dungeons and Dragons game, which Angela was, um, Ange was DMing. And beforehand I was like, I don't know if I want to sign up for this game or not because I've never played 5th Ed, and I've played every other iteration of D&D, uh, but I've never played 5th Ed, and I'm like, I want to show up and not know how to play, and Mo's like, oh, you're good. You know, it's it's not that different, just go, you'll be fine, and I was like, I don't know, maybe I should, like, find a rule book and read it before I go, and he's like, no, no, you'll be okay. And I got there, and three of the other people at the table, like, one of the guys was like, I haven't played since 3.5, um, you know, I was not the only person that hadn't played 5th Ed, so that made me feel much more comfortable. And then I was like, oh, this is just D&D. Every, it's, it's so comfy. I'm like, yep, it's like getting your old sneakers out. I'm like, roll D20, there's my armor class. Hey, I like this. I mean, I enjoyed Long Live the Queen, but it's fate, and there's aspects, and all this weird stuff. <laughs> it makes me uncomfortable sometimes. And it was really cozy to just play D&D. And Ange is a fantastic DM and ran a really cool game. Like, I don't want to give it away because it's a game she runs at multiple cons, but all the characters had secrets and backgrounds that were interwoven and really played in in the game in a D&D game. You know, a combat-driven D&D game where you had some mystery solving and background and lots of really cool stuff. So it was a super fun game. Very solid. So my only thought about going on Sunday was if you want to take photographs of, of cosplayers, especially, it's probably a bit light on that for, uh, where, you know, compared to like a Saturday where it's horrible and, and awful and, and uncomfortable and there's way too people-y, but there's a whole lot of photo to, uh, subjects out there. Um, I don't know. There was still, I would say, 8.7 out of 10 people were in some form of costume, even on Sunday. What I thought was interesting was there were people that I saw that um, had a different outfit for each day of the con. So Sunday was their Sunday cosplay. Uh, there was a, a bunch of people that were there as professional cosplayers that had their own little booths and stuff, too. It was, right. yeah, it was interesting. Lots of really amazing costumes. It's... And there was giant paper mache Pokemon that uh, I guess a local Toronto artist makes. They were life-size Pokemon. You could, like, you know, Mewtwo, this big. They were really well done, very cool. Uh, and there was, I don't know, like six or seven of them in the kids' area. So I had never been in the family zone before, and I went and checked it out, and I'm like, massive Pokemon sculptures. I found the gaming area. It's hidden in the family zone. They actually had a pretty decent game library. It was nothing compared to Breakout, but, you know, there was actual... It wasn't, again, it wasn't Candyland. It wasn't play Monopoly. They had, like, Onitama set up and stuff, so I was like, that was pretty sweet. Cool. I went off the rails. Continue. <laughs> That's all good. Uh, so, not a lot more to say. Most of the rest of the day, uh, for me, was spent at base camp. Uh, eventually, Deanna joined us. No, did I meet? I can't remember now. Did you come meet us at the hotel? You came to Yeah, because I came yeah. at noon and played in Angela's game, and after, right, right. You were yeah. already there. Yeah, yeah. So most of the day was the two of us sitting at base camp uh, with everyone else. Again, base camp kind of grew and shrunk. Uh, it was basically saying goodbye to wave after wave of people, right? It'd be like, oh, this car load's leaving. So say goodbye to those four people. And then some people get off the elevator like, oh, you guys leaving? Yeah, we're leaving. So it was just kind of like wave after wave of people leaving the con. So kind of, you know, bittersweet, right? Like, it's cool to see these people, but... It was basically a day of goodbyes. Uh, the last thing we did at the con was a whole group of us hit up the podcasting 101 panel. Now, this was the last panel of the con, and it was run by Chris Nizak. So it was um, had some of the, the gem people in it. Mandy Hutchinson was on it. James D'Amato from the One Shot Network was there, as well as Senda. And, oh, I cannot remember her name from the Asians Talking Games podcast. I Agatha? 
that may be it. I don't remember off the Agatha top of my head. Chan, Agatha Chen was it, supposed to be on the Agatha panel, Chen. Right? Yeah, so she was there. Uh, and this was a really good panel. Like, fascinating. I got to say, eye-opening. Some of the stuff that came to light during that panel was, was rather surprising. Uh, Chris ran a fairly good panel, except he kept asking Agatha tech questions, and Daniel handles all that. So there was an awful lot. Agatha, so on your show, I, I'm sorry, Daniel does that. Um it was good. It, it was a solid, it was a good way to end the panel. Uh, I had a lot of my friends in it and a lot of my friends in the, like watching it too, right? Like in the crowd. So it felt like saying goodbye, right? That was nice. Uh, finished off that panel. I don't know, Danny, you have anything to say on that panel? No, it was a solid panel. I kept falling asleep, which had nothing to do with the panelists. I was just so zonked by that point. I was done and Mo kept elbowing me. So I have to assume I was snoring. It was bad. Yeah, just, just a little bit. <laughs> Uh, it was good. It was a good way to end it. Um, at that point, we basically said goodbye. We left there. We went back to base camp for maybe 10, 15 minutes at, at most. Um, then we're like, we got to go. So, um, you know, we, we, we said our goodbyes, gave our hugs, said goodbye to all these people that we only get to see a couple times a year. Uh, walked back to the Sheraton Center. Uh, we were already checked out, but we had to get our bags. Um, then we had some time to kill. And this was kind of cool because... Deanna showed me a hidden gem in Toronto. So here's something for you people who take the train in is if you head down the skywalk towards the CN tower, very shortly after you leave union station is this thing called up the UP, which connects union uh, union station to Pearson airport. And they have a train that goes back and forth between the two. So that's also for people coming in from the airport. It's a good way to get downtown. Well, right above the train station is this thing called the up UP for you, you know, the, the whole lounge, Upstairs Lounge, with UP being capitalized. Now, this is a really cool spot. It's owned by, sponsored by Mill Street Brewery and CIBC. So they sell all the Mill Street beers and they have uh, like a light eats menu, right? You're not going to go there for dinner. Uh, we got a charcuterie board that was good and we each had a couple beers. Uh, really cool spot to kill 45 minutes to an hour while you're waiting for your train. Much cooler than sitting in Union Station. Yeah, Aaron first showed me that spot right after it first opened up. I guess they used to serve the best root beer, like non-alcoholic oh. root beer that Mill Street brewed. And we went in there and asked for it. And they're like, yeah, we don't carry it anymore because it was too popular. We couldn't keep it in stock. And I'm like, well, that's the stupidest reason I've ever heard. <laughs> but, yeah. yeah. Well, you know what, though? If enough people are coming in getting angry because you don't have it, yeah, I guess right? that, that so. would be the... But yeah, really, really cool, really cool. Like I said, hidden gem. Like it's just literally like five minute walk up up the uh, the skywalk. So that was pretty cool. Um, so on the the ride home, we again took the train. Again, business class was really nice. Um, the late night train they offer you a lot more to drink. Um, I did some reading um, on High Plane Samurai. So yes, that's the game I mentioned with that I, Todd Crapper ran. I did buy a copy, so I was reading some High Plane Samurai on the way way home. Um, yeah, I had some butter chicken for dinner, so I guess it was an Indian weekend for me. That was fantastic. The beer selection was a lot better on the way back, so I actually got a lug tread. They did run out of lug tread, and then I was drinking Rickard's Red, which isn't great, but it's better than Blue, Bud, and Canadian. Um, and basically enjoyed a quiet ride home. It was a train. They brought me lots of coffee. It was good. <laughs> yeah. Coffee. Uh, we did get into Windsor rather late. I'm not sure why the train was late. They didn't really tell us why. But uh, Dee's mom gave us a ride home, and we got home. Uh, it was well after midnight, and we crashed. So that was pretty much it. We crashed hard. Crashed for like a day and a half. <laughs> yes. Mon Monday was wasted. <laughs> Yeah, Monday there was, was wasted. There was there was a there was a, a significant period of time during the day when I thought, hmm, Twitter is quiet, Messenger is quiet. Where are the Mo and B? And and then at <laughs> yeah. four and then at four o'clock, you briefly got up. There was a a splattering of of uh, social media posting, and then I think you guys went back to bed to try and you know reset your schedules. Yeah, even though it's not like we had time zones or whatever. I don't know. Con con crash. What a con drop is con, real. Con drop. Yep. Yeah, con drop is real. And now, a word from our sponsor. So, we've talked quite a bit over the last couple of weeks about the awesome Quiver playing card carrying case. Now, that's the PU leather case that holds up to 1,350 unsleeved cards, comes with two types of straps, Velcro and acrylic dividers, and has a mesh pocket? Yep, that one. 
Uh, the one we actually saw everywhere at Breakout. There were a lot of quivers everywhere at Breakout. They, they, everyone seemed to have one. Well, not everyone, but quite a few people. Now, the thing is, Quiver Time doesn't just do cases. They also offer premium card sleeves to protect your cards in that case. Crafted with heavy-duty polypropylene, these ultra-clear card sleeves come in three packs with 100 sleeves each, allowing you to protect and cover your active deck cards and any cards you keep in your Quiver Time card case. Complete acid and PVC free, these precision cut sleeves offer a form-fitting design that makes the cards easy to shuffle for fast, high-level play no matter your chosen tabletop gaming choice. Now, QuiverTime is so confident in these sleeves that they even offer a money-back guarantee. Now, the best part of all, these sleeves are eligible for your special Tabletop Bellhop discount code. That's right. For the entire month of March, head over to Amazon.com, Amazon.ca, or QuiverTime, or the QuiverTime website at QuiverTime.com slash Bellhop, and use the code DINGDING for 10% off the entire line of QuiverTime products, including their Apollo sleeves. Though do note that Amazon.com, you do have to use ding, 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 one extra ding, three of them, because they wouldn't let us use the same code on Amazon Canada and Amazon US. Silly Amazon. Now, we are growing through the support of fans like you, so if you haven't yet, please take a minute to subscribe, like, rate, review, click on the bell, thumbs up, or share to your friends. Wherever and however you find us, you can help us grow. Sign up to receive Tabletop Bellhop Weekly in your inbox. Once a week, I will be sending out an email recapping all the content we've released in the week previous. Blog posts, new podcast episodes, reviews, con updates, and anything else we create. You can sign up at newsletter.tabletopbellhop.com or go over to the tabletopbellhop.com webpage and you'll find a spot to subscribe in the sidebar. Now... A quick shout out and a thank you to our Patreon backers. Their support helps make this show possible. I misdirected Mark. Join Phil, Chris, Bob, and Camden every Tuesday night at 6 p.m. the Queen's time or 8 p.m. Eastern as they talk games and games mastering. Brian Kurtz, thank you. Duran Barnett, thanks. Joe Swick, thank you. Jeff Seuss, you got to go to breakout next year. William Fisher, thank you. Diane Tuzano. Thanks, Ma. Danielle Thomas, thank you. P.S. Goujon, thanks. Andrew Dacey, thank you. Well, that was the double bell. That means my shift is coming to an end, and I've already done far too much overtime today. We're going to have to lock those front doors. Though the doors to the lobby are closed, you can always find us across the web and social media as Tabletop Bellhop, one word. You can also find us on Board Game Geek under guild number 3347. Drop by our website at tabletopbellhop.com for more gaming content. Uh, if you like the content we're providing and would like to support our continued efforts, please consider tipping the bellhop at patreon.com slash tabletopbellhop. Remember to join us here on Twitch every Wednesday night, 9.30 p.m. Eastern, and watch for the Tabletop Bellhop Gaming Podcast to hit your podcatchers in YouTube at 2 a.m. Eastern every Tuesday. Well, that about wraps up the time we have for the show tonight. For those of you here live, thank you for joining us. Hang around and join us in the penthouse suite for the Off the Books After Show. For Tabletop Bellhop Live, I'm Sean. And I'm Mo. And I'm Deanna. Thank you. And game on. <laughs>